100 North Capitol Street Northwest, Suite 650. In Washington, D.C., the zip code is 20001. Up next on C-SPAN, it's a one-year review of the Exxon Valdez oil spill cleanup and damage assessment by the House Interior and Insular Affairs Subcommittee on water power and offshore energy resources. Witnesses at Tuesday's hearing included a representative of the National Wildlife Foundation, the Executive Vice President of Exxon Company USA, and the General Counsel to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The uh, Subcommittee on Water and Power and Offshore Energy Resources uh, will come to order for the purposes of continuing our oversight hearings on the investigation of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And this, is, uh, this hearing this morning is a one-year review of Exxon Alaska's oil spill cleanup and operation and damage assessment. This is a continuation of the hearings that were started in March, March 22nd. Uh, the first panel will be made up of, of Robert Adler, who is the Senior Staff Attorney, Natural Resources Defense Council, and Eric Olson, who is the Counsel of the Environmental Quality Division, National Wildlife Federation, both from Washington, uh, D.C. Gentlemen, welcome to the, uh, uh, to the committee. I believe you have been informed that it is the, the practice of the subcommittee to swear all witnesses who appear before it at investigative hearings. Do you have any objections to being sworn? No. No, sir. If you stand, <coughs> raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. In order to inform you of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations on the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives and the committee are on the table in front of you, and both sets of rules have previously been provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you desire to be represented by counsel? No, sir. No, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Adler, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to testify today. As you know, NRDC has been active in uh, issues involving oil and gas development in Alaska for quite some time. And our worst fears about the possible impacts of that development were realized with the Exxon Valdez oil spill. We are here today primarily to address um, serious inadequacies in the natural resource damage assessment program for the oil spill. We were scheduled originally to testify about a month ago, and when I sat down to rewrite my testimony last week, I realized that there was very little to, re to rewrite because essentially nothing has changed from the public's perspective. We have received essentially no new important information about what is going on in the damage assessment, and that, I would say, is symptomatic of the problems to date. In fact, in the six months since we submitted our uh, detailed comments on the draft damage assessment, nothing has changed. And I can only express our extreme frustration at our inability to uh, properly track, much less um, effectively participate in the, in the damage assessment process. The damage assessment is important for three reasons. First, it is the foundation of the Federal and State Government's economic damage claims against Exxon. And without an adequate damage assessment, Exxon can, and Alyeska cannot properly be held accountable for the spill. Second, from a matter of sheer public policy, an adequate damage assessment is essential to understand what the effects are of major oil spills such as this. And therefore, it is uh, critical to future decision making, a concern which is far from theoretical given that virtually all of the reports that have come out since the accident have predicted that spills like this can and will occur in the future. And while most of those are in the form of detailed uh, scientific reports, perhaps the most telling account that I have heard was the testimony of a tourboat operator out of Valdez at the oil spill restoration symposium in Anchorage last month, at which he testified that he had pers personally witnessed 
an oil tanker at Valdez being um, loaded in 80 knot winds, uh, which indicates the fact that the attitude of the oil industry and Alyeska to continue the oil flowing through the pipeline um, regardless of conditions and regardless of safety concerns persists even after the spill. Now, we had very serious concerns about the damage assessment process from the outset. In recent months, our concerns have been exacerbated. Not only have, uh, has the damage assessment not been expanded, but according to the um, testimony of Commissioner Collinsworth last month before this committee, uh, the Trustee Council recommended severe cu uh, cutbacks in the damage assessment this year. And according to his written testimony, 23 of those studies will be discontinued this year and an additional 21 studies will be cut back. Mr. Olson will address in more detail our limited information about which of those studies were being cut back. Second, it appears that the administration's position is not to seek supplemental appropriations to pay for the damage assessment process this year. Instead, those um, continuing studies will be paid for by reprogramming um, funds from existing agency <laughs> programs. Again, we don't have any information um, today as to where that money is coming from and what existing agency programs will be cut back to pay for the damage assessment. As I said earlier, our, our first critique of the assessment is that it's been done almost entirely in secret and continues so to this day. Uh, the draft plan that we commented on last fall was so cursory and so lacking in detail that our expert um, witnesses, our scientists that we commissioned to review the plan, uniformly said that there was nothing serious for them to comment on and that the proposal would not pass muster in any government permit application or any grant proposal to any funding organization. Second, in essence, the funding, uh, the uh, public comment opportunity was entirely after the fact. We were asked to comment on studies that had already been done the year before and the pattern continues this year. We haven't received information on what studies will be conducted this summer, and it appears that any opportunity to comment will be too late, effectively, to comment on this year's field season. And finally, and perhaps most important at this point, none of the information um, from the damage assessment last year has been made public. Now, the criteria being used to decide which studies to continue or whether or not sufficient damage was discovered last year to warrant continuing study. And obviously we have no fair opportunity to address that issue if we don't know what was found last year. The secrecy that has per pervaded uh, the damage assessment process and other parts of the spill response was underscored um, a couple of months ago by the secret plea bargain agreement that was announced between Exxon and the uh, federal government, um, I said announced, but I should say um, was discovered um, uh, through happenstance rather than through proper public notice. We've received no word since the indictments were handed down about the continuing nature of those in negotiations. But again, I'd underscore that it was another example of how public rights were being negotiated in secret and we had no fair opportunity to comment. Um, it was also indicative of the failure of the state and federal governments to work together adequately on the uh, damage assessment um, and litigation process. Um, and we understand that two months after the memorandum of understanding between the federal and state trustees has expired, uh, that MOU still has not successfully been renegotiated. If the federal and the state governments cannot get together and work together that just gives Exxon the upper hand and uh, we have to express our serious concern that the federal and state trustees appear not to be working together to this day. Let me turn to our two major criticisms of the damage assessment process in the hopes that we can have something done about it this year. First, uh, the plan is being designed piecemeal in a year-to-year -year fashion and again our experts uniformly indicated that what's needed is a comprehensive, coordinated, multi-year damage assessment. Equally important, the plan focuses on a series of studies that are designed to address individual species, regardless of the overall ecosystem's effect. 
And again, all of our experts were unanimous that in order to get a full long-term understanding of the effects of the spill, you need to take a broader ecosystems approach. And let me give you a few examples of both of those primary critiques. The, the reasons why long-term studies are needed are typically obvious. Uh, reproductive effects on species cannot be measured until at least one reproductive cycle has passed. Um, salmon uh, are a good example. If you tag and study salmon for about one year, you won't know what the long-term effects on the population will be. Um, bioaccumulation and biomagnification of toxics is a phenomenon that we won't know for several years rather than just with one year of study. And some of the effects are even more subtle. And the water chemists who we commissioned to critique the study said that some of the long-term changes in water chemistry might persist for decades, if not up to a century. And again, a one-year damage assessment is not sufficient for those purposes. One of our experts, Dr. Pat Lane, wrote that long-term damage is undoubtedly the most important in terms of both the total amount of damage and in terms of ecosystem vi viability. This particular oil spill will probably be visible for decades. Um, again, six months after we submitted those comments, we have absolutely no information about what types of long-term studies will be um, uh, commissioned for this spill. The ecosystem um, point that I raised earlier, again, Dr. Lane uh, found that this was perhaps the most important um, phenomenon to be measured in the spill. Uh, quote, there is no evidence that an ecosystem approach will be taken to examine and quantify food web effects related to the oil spill. The amount of true damage could be underestimated by orders of magnitude because of the absence of ecosystem type studies in the spill. And again, to bring this point home, I'd like to give you a few examples of the types of studies recommended by our exper experts that appear not to be addressed in the damage assessment. First, there has been no effort to study the long-term cumulative effects of the spill through ecological mod models. And in the appendices to our uh, comments, we, uh, our experts gave a number of examples of the types of models that can and should be used in this damage assessment process. Second, there's no study of how the oil um, exposure will affect primary productivity. And again, our experts gave examples of how that could be done. Little evidence of uh, studies to uh, uh, study the effect of uh, hydrocarbons in sediment and the persistence of those hydrocarbons and the resulting effects on benthic communities. Little evidence of um, studies of microbial populations, of micro and macro plant and alg algal communities. And the secondary effects of the spill on predator prey relationships, uh, reproductive success, and other ecosystem types of effects of the spill. If these problems are not corrected this summer and beyond, we will essentially be relegated to counting carcasses, to counting dead bodies. We won't know what the long-term effects of the spill are on the ecosystem as a whole. Finally, uh, we have some suggestions as to what this committee and the rest of Congress could do to remedy this situation beginning uh, right now. First of all, and most important, we believe that Congress should step in by passing supplemental appropriations adequate to pay for this year's damage assessment and, in fact, for a multi-year damage assessment. In passing that legislation, Congress could correct some of the problems that I identified earlier. For example, the funding legislation could clarify that the damage assessment should be multi-year and as long and as comprehensive as necessary to study the long-term ecosystem effects of the spill. Legislation could also specify that any information derived from the study should be made public as soon as possible. And uh, that goes to my second point, um, that Congress could join the environmental community in demanding that this process, both the damage assessment process and the subsequent restoration process, should be as open and as public as possible. We believe that such open process is required by current law, but if there's any doubt, additional legislation could be passed to clarify that point. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Eric Olson. I'm the counsel for the Environmental Quality Division of the National Wildlife Federation. 
which is the nation's largest environmental group with about 5.8 million members and supporters. We appreciate the opportunity to testify on the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which we consider probably this the worst single ecological catastrophe in U.S. history. The government trustees have abdicated their duty to fully assess the environmental devastation wreaked by the spill. Three of the most important problems with the government's damage assessment have been, first, the trustees' refusal to initiate many important studies and their recent secret decision to terminate about 24 of the most important studies now that the spill has receded somewhat from public attention. Second, the trustees have failed to develop plans for and to assess the costs of restoring, replacing, and acquiring resor natural resources equivalent to those that have been destroyed. And third, lawyers rather than scientists have driven the assessment process, which has interfered with the scientists' efforts to fully analyze the spill's impacts and to assure that the all-important open scientific process that's needed to assess the impacts of the spill takes place. In terms of dead animals and dead birds the wide and widespread ecological disruption, the Valdez was probably the worst oil spill ever in, in the world. Scientists have recovered carcasses of 150 bald eagles, a th over 1,000 sea otters, 35,000 waterfowl and other birds, and the bodies of many other forms of life ranging from deer to whales that have likely been killed by the spill. But these carcasses really only represent the most obvious impacts of the spill, the tip of the iceberg. Studies have found that workers are only able to find a very tiny pr percentage of the actual number of dead birds. Thus, it's likely that many hundreds of thousands of birds have died, but that their bodies will never be found. The same can be said of sea otters and many other forms of life. While dead birds and otters have received a lot of public attention, Many of the impacts of the Exxon Valdez spill cannot be captured by TV cameras or magazine covers. These more subtle and insidious impacts of the spill are more expensive and difficult to measure than the collection of otter and bird carcasses. The entire food web of the affected areas have been very seriously disrupted. Many birds cannot reproduce in the wake of the spill. The eggs of bald eagles, for example, may die when they're exposed to just a few drops of oil brought to the nest on the feathers of unwitting adults. The spill also has killed many of the organisms th that make poor photographic subjects, but that form the foundation of the entire food web. I won't go into the details of the food web studies that are needed because Mr. Adler has done so, but we would certainly support um, wholeheartedly his recommendations. To date, unfortunately, the federal and state so-called trustee council has been rife with bickering, primarily due to the opposition of some of the federal trustees in the Justice Department to conducting research on many of the spill's impacts, the job of fully assessing the <coughs> injuries uh, and the spill's impacts has simply um, not been done. There is no lead trustee and the state has been cut out of many of the important trustee discussions. The scientific cooperative agreement, as Mr. Adler has noted, has been terminated and not reinstated. The federal government repeatedly has insisted that certain studies should not be completed because they will be too expensive. But all of those studies are crucial to obtaining a complete picture of the overall spill impacts. They also could form the basis of a large damage recovery and will be difficult to predict before the studies are completed. The damage assessment plan announced that although it was expected that many years of impacts would continue, all the studies would terminate by February of this year. Extensions were to be permitted only if the trustees decided, without any form of public disclosure or review, that the studies should be continued after that date. Those decisions to terminate now apparently have been made. We have learned that about 24 of the studies have been re recommended for termination or have actually already been terminated. And as Mr. Adler says, none of this has been made public knowledge. And perhaps seven more studies are on the chopping block, according to our information. The public and Congress have never been notified of these facts. But we understand that, for example, studies on mink, river otters, birds, including the peregrine falcon, marbled merlets, storm petrels, pigeon guillemots, kitty wakes, glaucous winged gulls, sea ducks, many species of fish, such as sports fish, oysters, 
larval fish, rockfish, scallops, sea urchins, dolly varden char, deer, many of the marine mammals such as humpback whales and black bears will either be terminated or cut back so severely that they may not provide any meaningful results. Without these and many other critically needed studies, the public is never going to know what the full extent of the damage was that was wreaked by the spill, and Exxon and the Alaska Consortium could escape the pain, the full cost of the ecological damages of the spill. The second important problem with the assessment stems from the trustees' failure to focus on assessing the costs and feasibility of restoring, replacing, and acquiring equivalent resources to those destroyed by the spill. In the U.S. Court of Appeals decision, known as the State of Ohio versus Department of Interior, the D.C. Circuit made it clear that polluters have to pay for environmental restoration plus the lost use value of the resources. However, the trustees are only now beginning to develop their initial plans to look at restoration. To our knowledge, no actual restoration projects or studies of restoration costs have even been initiated. The trustees simply have not given the central issue sufficiently serious attention. The third major problem that's arisen during the assessment has derived from the role of lawyers in, in deciding how the assessment should be conducted. The assessment has had its parameters decided by lawyers and policymakers who often have little appreciation for the more subtle and difficult to measure but ecologically extremely important impacts of the spill. The scientists conducting the studies often have been ignored and overruled. This is short-sighted and will re result in a poor understanding of the overall impacts of the spill. Only an open scientific process in which data are shared by all scientists will assure that the damage wrought by the spill is adequately studied. A final generic problem with the assessment has been the surprising tendency of the governments to keep the studies and virtually the entire damage assessment process secret. We have several recommendations as to what Congress can do. And let me reemphasize what Mr. Adler has suggested, which is Congress really needs to address the need for adequate and immediate damage assessment funding, not only for the Exxon Valdez, but for other oil spills. Exxon has refused to pay for most of the needed damage assessment studies. We believe that Exxon should be responsible and Alyeska for paying for these studies. And the agencies have not asked for adequate funding. Congress should immediately mandate and appropriate sufficient funds to pay for the next two years at least of the v Exxon Valdez spill assessment. This will guarantee that critical data are not lost and that the spillers are held responsible for the full extent of the damage. Second, Congress should send a very clear signal to the trustees in the Valdez case that full damages, including restoration of all parts of the environment, must be recovered. Third. In adopting comprehensive oil spill legislation, we recommend that first, the law should provide an opportunity for citizens to force trustees to perform their duties to assess damages when they're not already doing so. Secondly, the new legislation should require the damage assessment rules to be overhauled so they'll help rather than hinder the trustees' recovery of damages. Third, they should mandate, the law should mandate more meaningful public participation in the assessment process. And fourth, it should provide that studies of the overall impacts of the spill on an ecosystem must be conducted irrespective of whether the trustees can be absolutely certain that large economic damages will be recovered as a result of those studies. And our final recommendation is that Congress should insist that the trustees provide the public with a meaningful role in the Exxon Valdez damage assessment process as well and should hold the government publicly accountable for its assessment and for any settlement of the litigation in this case. With the actions proposed above, the damage assessment in the Valdez spill could be significantly improved. If we learn the lessons from the spill, perhaps in the future damage assessments for other spills will be better planned and better executed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you. Your, your testimony raises a, a, a number of, of, of serious concerns, and certainly I think when pitted against public expectations, they, uh, they seem to become even more serious. First of all, uh, what you seem to be suggesting in, in, in fairly strong tones is that, that we, are, we are sort of customizing science here to fit litigation, as opposed to making litigation uh, decisions later based upon what scientific evidence is at hand or isn't at hand. 
and that uh, uh, and I just wonder is, is that a, is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair summary of what's going on based on our discussions with uh, both attorneys and scientists involved in the matter. So it's, it's conceivable if I read, uh, and I'm kind of taking your testimony together here, so feel free to, to comment, but if I read your testimony correctly, uh, what you're suggesting is that while some lines of, of, of damage assessment and scientific inquiry and benchmark studies uh, that may be necessary for a better understanding of what happens when you have this kind of catastrophic spill and may be necessary in terms of understanding what's going to happen in the future with respect to uh, fish and wildlife and or the environment generally uh, may be shelved by the involved attorneys because it's not very likely to recover for that, that, that particular type of damage or it's too speculative at this point uh, or it, it's too, it may be too complicated to, uh, to explain within the litigation process. Is that think, fair to I say? I think that's fair. And one of the big problems here is that we don't have much experience with really doing these long-term studies, nor do we have much experience with litigating this type of case. So conservative attorneys, as they will, um, tend to opt in favor of going for the sure thing rather than trying to let the scientists do their thing, which is to try to fully understand for the public benefit what the impacts of the spill were. So that's really suffering. But there's two, there's really two, two processes going on, aren't there? I mean, there's one which, uh, if, if I might, was, was heralded by, by Exxon, and that is that, uh, that they were going to uh, take responsibility for this spill, that they were going to restore the environment of Prince William Sound and the, and the surrounding area if impacted. Uh, and the expectation that that restoration would take place with the full understanding, uh, I think, that uh, some of the impacts as a result of this spill would not be known for a considerable period of time during the, the, the cycles of, 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 of the life of the, of, of the fish and the wildlife and or seasons or, or changes uh, that, that we expect and, and, and uh, understand in, in nature. The other one is whether, what is the right of the public to recover for, for those damages. But it seems to me that, that, that the second has, has somewhat overwhelmed the, uh, the first. And, and Exxon can either, either fulfill its commitment or renege on its commitment. The government separately can either uh, force them or, or sue them at least to try to get them to fulfill what the government believes Exxon's obligation is, and the two may be different. The two may be different. But in fact, the need for, as I understand it, as I watch this assessment, the need for the scientific understanding of the impact of this kind of catastrophic spill is separate from both of those. Well, I would suggest that um, since the law requires I mean, can... restoration, however, um, you have to know the impact, the long-term impacts of this spill to know how to restore it. So it's our view that really the federal trustees and the state trustee really have the obligation to assure that we understand the full long-term impacts of this spill in order to know what to do to restore it. And that point was driven home by this Court of Appeals decision last year that said the polluter has to pay for that long-term restoration. And unfortunately, I guess that message hasn't gotten through to the trustees. But but again, let me just see if I, if I, I can develop this. It seems to me that, that, that independent of, of, of Exxon's legal obligations and Exxon's moral obligations and the claims of the, of the people of the United States for recovery and restoration in one, one form or another, is the development of a body of knowledge upon which those decisions can be made. And in the hurry to, to rush to, to uh, uh, legal settlement or to trial or to decide whether you're going to proceed criminally or civilly or what have you, that process is now starting to overwhelm the scientific process. I think and, that's right. And so in fact, it would appear from your testimony, and others will disagree with you later today, but it would appear from your testimony that you believe that that, uh, that, that process is now starting to be prostituted in the name of, 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 of sort of the litigation interest as opposed to the scientific interest. 
that fairly states my position. Let me ask you this. On the issue of whether or not uh, you do one-year studies, then you review those studies, and then you decide to do a second-year study, uh, I'm not quite sure I understand, but if you would just lay out for me, what is the risk that we run there in terms of the loss of, 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 of understanding this, uh, this spill? My understanding from, again, reading your combined testimonies is that certain things may not appear in those first-year studies, so you tend to say that's not a problem, but later those things, those things that you were concerned about could show up down the road two and three years from now or something similar could show up that you may have better understood had you continued a longer, a longer term study. And it would appear to me as a, as a lay person that you get to the point where this process naturally restricts the scientific, the, the scientific endeavor in understanding the spill. Because whatever doesn't show up early, its chances of being studied later are, are substantially reduced each and every 12 months. What our experts have told us is that you can predict fairly beforehand how many years it will take you to study what the effects on the bald eagle population will be. And if it's a five-year study or a ten-year study, then you should design a five- or a ten-year study and not go through an incremental year-by-year -year, um, uh, study plan for the reasons that you articulated and just for the, the sake of a, a good coordinated study. You might do things differently in year one if you um, have planned a full five-year study than if you wait from year to year to decide what to do next. And what's the scientific basis on which, on which this, uh, this protocol, if you will, is being, is being developed? We think this protocol was developed for uh, or being driven by funding considerations and perhaps by litigation considerations and not by good science. <clears throat> with, respect, with respect to the... Uh, to the funding, uh, does not the, the government, in fact, has a right to come back at the responsible party for uh, uh, for the cost of these studies at a later date? That's correct. The and question is when. Um, when is that money available to the trustees? Can they demand it up front um, when they need the money, or do they have to do all the studies and then come back to the um, to Exxon? My understanding is to date we've spent about thirty-five million dollars on these studies. And Exxon has funded uh, 15 million, that's so we're 20 million dollars in the hole. Already, and to that's the, the agencies first, yeah. are out of pocket, if you will. Right. And, and we have and no request for supplemental appropriations. Correct. And yet, again, this is in theory. If you now come back through the litigator's eyes, this is in theory the body of knowledge that you're going to use to develop liability for, uh, for damages and for restoration liability, correct? That's right. So if you're the defendant, if you're Exxon, this is, this is a dream scenario. Yeah, if you can hold off on paying um, the damages for the damage assessment yourself and the trustees are really hard up for cash, um, it's, it puts the defendant in a very so, much better so, position. So in fact now what we, what we, have, what we have set up is a scenario where in the early days when, when the cameras are running, Exxon commits itself to $15 million to do all of the studies. Of course, we find out now that's not all of the studies. Uh, and now the agencies are, are stuck for $20 million of the studies that are being done because of the Exxon oil spill. Nobody had planned to do these studies prior to the oil spill. And those agencies now are forced into the situation of either curtailing other legitimate public activities and reprogramming money to respond to the disaster that's created by Exxon, or these studies won't be done, and a proper assessment of restoration and damages uh, uh, is, 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 is certainly drawn into question. Because we also know that while Exxon is not paying for the public studies, they, they are engaged in a whole series, some 23 or 24 studies, maybe more uh, studies on their own in terms of developing their litigation defense. That's right. That's and all correct. The more information that Exxon has from their own studies, um, the more they'll be able to counter what the um, federal trustees and the state trustee may have put together themselves. So they're 
Exxon will be accumulating its own information base, and they are doing that now. And they will have that under their, in their hip pocket when the litigation comes to the fore. So do we know, do, and, and if I'm asking to speculate, don't, but because but, uh, I will ask Exxon later, but uh, is Exxon doing one-year studies? Are they doing long-term studies? Do we know what, what kind of uh, integrated program they have? We have some idea of the program that they are undertaking. We do know that it is more of an ecosystem type approach than the, the federal and state trustees appear to be. I don't know if it's a year to year plan. I don't know. But if this should, if this should drag on, uh, the, the er emergency dire supplemental has essentially left Congress. It's being debated on issues of El Salvador, if you will, not on this issue. Uh, so if the monies aren't forthcoming for these studies, and this should drag on to the next year, and we go into court in year three or four or five, assuming that we, we go to litigation as opposed to some kind of settlement, uh, it may be that, that Exxon is superiorly, uh, superiorly armed with respect to evidence and, and continuity of studies and the government may be coming to court with studies that have either been interrupted uh, or weren't started on a timely basis. I mean, I'm trying to think like a lawyer. I try not to most of my life, but I try to this case. Uh, so, there, so there's all kinds of questions that may uh, be raised against uh, uh, the body of evidence being put together by the trustees. Is that conceivable? Uh, yes. That's a very distinct possibility. And I think there are two things that are happening. You're, not only are you losing data, um, since these studies are not being started up, a lot of them have to get started in the next few weeks, really, to assure that you've got another season of data. So if they aren't started relatively quickly, you're going to lose what's a whole season of what's data. What's your understanding of what the likelihood of that is? Um, for the ones that have been decided for termination, I can't imagine how they're going to be started up unless something really um, substantial happens in the next few weeks. Um, Do you have any understanding of where the process of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of reprogramming is? I don't. I'm just asking. No, I don't. And the other important thing to keep in mind is the, the human beings that are doing these studies, um, they're being told now that their studies have been terminated and they've got to do something with the, get, to get on with their lives. So a lot of those experts that have dedicated many years in some cases to studying these resources are going to move along to some other issue and will no longer be working on the spill. So we may lose a lot of the expertise and institutional knowledge um, that we had before. So having these continual reviews and mixed messages sent to the scientists is resulting in some real serious problems along at the staff level with many of the scientists. What's, what's, the, what's the distinction for the committee if, if whether or not we, we follow uh, the rules as they were prior to the Ohio case or after the Ohio case? What's the difference for the public here in our understanding? Well, the rules before the Ohio case, um, the court called them very crabbed. Um, the problem was that they so minimized the damages that were available to the trustees that very often the trustees, just, it wouldn't be worth their while to do the studies or even to do the assessment. Um, after the court's decision, and I might add, I think it would be a good question to ask interior um, when those revised rules are going to be coming out. Um, but uh, under the court's decision, now full restoration costs have to be paid for unless they're, quote, grossly disproportionate to some other values. And in addition, the, um, the trustees would assess the lost values of the resources in addition to the restoration costs. So um, we certainly hope and believe that the um, trustees will be using the court's decision and guiding them in how to interpret the statutes. What's the requirement on them to do that? Uh, well, we believe that the, sta that the Clean Water Act, Section 311 of the Clean Water Act, which was construed by the court, uh, makes it quite clear that you have to pay for restoration plus um, the loss of these other values. And um, I certainly hope that that's... So absent the, the DOI actions, you still believe that they're, they're bound by that decision? We certainly do. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, um, <clears throat> you both of you have talked substantially uh, about the um, 
business of an assessment. Is there a criteria? Would people agree on what the assessment ought to include, or, or would each of us have a different view? How can you conclude that the assessment is not proper unless there's some sort of a condition? Well, as Mr. Olson just um, explained, based on the Clean Water Act and the court decision construing the act, um, Exxon is responsible to compensate the American public for the full value of the resources lost or damaged uh, by the spill, including lost use values. So the criteria for the damage assessment are measured against uh, what Exxon's ultimate responsibility is. So there is a requirement under this court decision that's quite clear that we have to recover the cost of restoration. If you can't restore the environment, um, one must replace the resources or acquire similar resources. Plus, there are a lot of lost values, and the court said that those would be recovered in addition to the restoration and acquisition costs. Were these conditions uh, set forth in the, uh, I understand there was a uh, draft uh, analysis or uh, assessment made public in, I think it was August of 89. Uh, were, th were those conditions in that? Well, many of them were. Um, our you indicated there had been no public input. Is that a fact? Well, the problem has been that those, that assessment plan came out after the studies had already been started. And one of our major comments on the assessment plan was, um, first of all, that it didn't focus on the restoration side of things. It focused mostly on the lost value. And secondly, that it did not focus on the long-term ecosystem type damages. It was sort of this short-term um, uh, piecemeal type approach to studying the damages. So that was really our only opportunity to comment. And we have no idea whether those comments really had any impact. And what we're hearing is that probably they, the um, trustees really have not made any sub substantial changes in the assessment. Mm, I see. One criterion that the <clears throat> excuse me, the damage assessment plan omitted on its face was the third criterion of acquisition of, replace, of, um, of additional habitat. It discussed to some extent restoration and replacement, but not acquisition of replacement habitat or resources. The principles in this uh, among the trustees come from what, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Forest Service, uh, and agencies that are not notorious for being hostile to wildlife and so on. Do you, are, is there some kind of a conspiracy in your view to not do the proper job here? Why do you think that, uh, that they're not meeting your expectations? Well, I, I don't think there's a conspiracy here, but again, I would say that um, funding considerations and, and sort of narrow litigation concerns are driving the process. Uh, we believe that good science ought to drive the litigation and not uh, vice versa. And I, I would emphasize that at the staff level, a lot of the scientists want a lot of these studies to go forward. It's uh, more funding considerations and these very short-term narrow litigation concerns that are overriding the long-term scientific judgment of many of the experts in the field. So uh, the uh, making available money seems to be the the point that you all favor the most, both of you. Is that correct? Th that's certainly um, <laughs> the main driving factor. Attached to the money ought to be additional improvements in the uh, damage assessment process, as we've outlined. Did, didn't we spend approximately $30 million in this last year? Uh, $30, $35 million and last it, year. Aren't they waiting to hear from Exxon for an additional 20? They are waiting to hear from Exxon, but meanwhile, the clock is ticking and the summer rapidly is approaching. Yes, and since right. you've got a limited field season in Alaska, that's yeah. a very critical window. I can understand the drive towards litigation sometimes, these things. Ours also, according to a paper in Alaska, uh, some drive by scientists to get more money in, in, the, in the allegedly overstating some of the pr provisions, which I presume Mr. Collingsworth from the Game and Fish is a scientist. Wouldn't we, you say there's a over, uh, maybe a drive from scientists for more money uh, that would cr lend a little problem to credibility? Y yes, there was certainly some impetus, um, particularly at the be beginning, to do quote unquote hobby research, research that wasn't properly related to the damage assessment. But we also understand that very early, those sorts of studies were weeded out from the damage assessment process. What we're talking about are studies that were conducted last year and were agreed upon as necessary for the damage assessment. I see. Is there a possibility that as <coughs> studies begin, there becomes an initial 
uh, uh, recognition that that study will not be useful and wouldn't it be reasonable then to conclude that? Is that a possibility? Again, our experts have advised us that for many of the studies you wouldn't necessarily expect to find damage in the first year, I that see. you need to study for several years in order to get the full picture. Many, an important point is that many of these, the natural cycles take more than one year. You don't, you're not necessarily going to see the impacts on reproduction in the first year. Or you won't necessarily see the impacts on phytoplankton and zooplankton in the first year because they're long cycles that um, it takes many years to fully So your contention is that some of these have been terminated before they've really had a chance to function. Right. I see. Well, I appreciate your comments, too. I'm sure we're all interested in, in trying to do what needs to be done here, and I guess that's the purpose of the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Adler, I think it's in your, in your testimony where you suggest that, that uh, previous uh, uh, previous drafts uh, of, of the assessment plan were for were, had suggested or were recommending uh, multi-year uh, studies. Is that yes. I, I can find it in your testimony, but I'm paraphrasing at the moment. But essentially, the, that uh, uh, that there were several other recomm several previous recommendations that said that this should be done on a multi-year basis. Can you elaborate? Yes, our understanding is that the first, I think, four drafts of the damage assessment plan were for five years and including funding those estimates. Dra those drafts were by whom? By the trustees. Um, those were not released to the public, but we understand based on discussions with various personnel that there were five-year plans and that after the final five-year draft came to Washington, D.C., it was determined that that would be cut back to a one-year uh, draft assessment. Do you, have, do you have any information as to the basis of that determination? Our understanding is that, again, it was driven by funding concerns, but we don't have um, much information on that. Let me ask you uh, uh, if, if you can address, again, your sort of your uh, version of, of what you think the impact of the uh, earlier proposed settlement that was then rejected by the state of Alaska and others, but, but uh, uh, what the impact of that, uh, that settlement would have been? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, I think it's important to point out that we do not oppose a settlement, and we certainly don't oppose a plea bargain. Our concern with, with the um, proposed settlement was um, with some of the terms that we understood were included in it. For example, um, it was our understanding that the proposed settlement would have $150 million up front that would go to the trustees, and then all $400 million that were to follow from that were contingent upon um, basically the trustees uh, fighting it out in court, perhaps, with Exxon um, over uh, whether the studies were needed, whether the particular restoration um, plans were necessary. Our concern was that um, essentially the government was getting very little for that, and in turn were, they were giving up uh, quite a bit. For example, um, we understood that the um, proposed plea bargain included a uh, provision that would allow Exxon to sit on the board that oversaw what studies were going to be done. There was no public input, no guarantee of public participation in that, but Exxon and the government would um, be determining what studies would go forward and what restoration plans would go forward. In addition, uh, and this is a criminal settlement, which is it's rather unusual to have the criminal defendant um, involved in deciding what um, studies should be done or what should be done to, um, to recover from what is alleged to be that criminal defendant's crimes. Uh, there were several other provisions in that that gave rise to quite a bit of concern, which maybe Bob would want to touch on. Well, I think in addition to the um, main point that we thought that Exxon wasn't being held fully and properly accountable, um, Exxon would have had tremendous leverage over the restoration um, process far more than the general public certainly would have um, beyond the initial $150 million assessment. With respect to the rest of the $550 million, the federal government, the trustees would have to submit to Exxon plans for how the money would be spent. 
to justify them almost as you would in a proposed rulemaking. And if Exxon objected, the money would go into escrow and would not be available for <laughs> spending on the restoration. So again, in addition to being what we thought was um, something of a slap on the wrist in terms of a punitive um, effect, it gave Exxon tremendous leverage over the process. Did Exxon, in fact, have a veto? Well, ultimately, the court would decide whether or not the money would have been properly spent. But again, in the interim, the restoration could grind to a halt. And it was also, at least as we understood it, it wasn't entirely clear what Exxon's role was on this board that oversaw the studies, whether they did have a veto on this board or whether they were simply advisory in nature. But as you, under, as you understand it, uh, and again, others can comment later, but as you, as you understand it, the, well, there's about $400 million that was going to be, be set aside to for the purposes of restoration, and, and is that correct? Well, that 150 million was the upfront amount, and then the 400 million would go through this bickering process. Okay, but in this process, if, uh, if the parties to the process decided that they wanted to conduct uh, a restoration effort and Exxon said no, then essentially that could not go forward until Exxon said yes because Exxon would have the right to take you to court. Or the court said yes. Or the court said, well, yeah, but you'd have to go to court. That's right. And then Exxon would have the right to appeal? Presumably, yes. And so, in, in effect, Exxon would have the right to, to delay for, for a, some period of time. It may be months. It may, in fact, be years, uh, uh, <laughs> that, that, that proposal going forward. Mm -hmm. And in addition, going hand in hand with this was apparently a moratorium on the federal government filing its own civil action. I was going to, I'll get to that, but just let me, let me, uh, this first part. So, so in effect, uh, uh, this wasn't a $550 million settlement because you don't know, had the court agreed with Exxon uh, in, in, in a number of these instances, the, the, the money spent would be, could, could be considerably less than $400 million, but it can never be more than $400 million. That's a cap on the settlement? On the criminal settlement, and of course, after four after years, four year period, you could initiate the litigation process, which, as you know, would take many more years to come to fruition. What, uh, uh, what in fact, would happen to the, the, the potential of, uh, of, of citizen suits with that four-year hiatus in there? Well, there would be nothing that would directly bar um, citizen suits. However, and perhaps the state could speak to this better, having the federal government with all of its scientific and other resources out of the picture for that period uh, certainly gives Exxon um, more of an upper hand in the litigation. And as I said earlier, um, we think the objective should be the state and the federal government, as well as um, citizens uh, working together um, to have the upper hand over Exxon and not vice versa. Let me ask you, uh, I guess this, we're coming kind of full circle here, but how would, it, how would I, as, as, a, as, as a member of Congress, looking at, at this proposed settlement, which is now, I guess, sort of uh, on the back burner for the moment, uh, looking at this, pro have any confidence that this $500 million had any relationship to potential uh, need for restoration given the, the, the state of the, uh, uh, of the scientific uh, work that's, be, that's been done to date. I mean, we've come, we're, we're essentially one year from the, uh, from the accident and a settlement was proposed and uh, we, we have no, no restoration plan in place or agreed to or finalized. We have uh, no long-term scientific protocols agreed to. Uh, how would I go home to my constituents and say, well, we, we did right by the public with respect to this uh, Exxon Valdez bill? Well, it's a good point. I don't think you'd have any basis whatsoever to make that statement. The $550 million appears to come out of thin air. It bears no relationship to the damage assessment and what we might reasonably predict the damages to be. 
And, um, and even more subtle but important point is the relationship between the damage assessment and the restoration process. We have no reason to believe that the damage assessment is uh, directed at determining what should be done in the restoration process. And that might be another question worthy of asking the Federal and State trustees how all those two processes are being coordinated. Well, thank you for your, uh, your testimony, both of you. Do you have any further questions, Mr. Thomas? Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your testimony. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear from a panel made up of Greg uh, Erickson, who is the director of the State of Alaska Oil Spill Impact Assessment and Restoration Program, and Mr. C.M. Harrison, the executive vice president, accompanied by Dr. Al Mackay, who is a senior environmental advisor, Exxon Company. Mackey. <clears throat> Dr. Mackey, I guess, is to be corrected here. Uh, welcome to the, uh, uh, to the committee. Uh, as I understand, you've been previously informed, uh, it is the practice of the subcommittee to swear all witnesses who appear before it at investigative hearings. Do you have any objections to being sworn? If you'd please uh, rise and stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. In order to inform you of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations on the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives and the committee are on the table in front of you. Both sets of the rules have been previously uh, been provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you, do you desire to be represented by counsel? No, sir. Thank you. Mr. Erickson, we will begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Greg Erickson. I am Director of Oil Spill Impact Assessment and Restoration for the Department of Fish and Game. And I appear here today uh, in place of Commissioner Don Collinsworth, who is the State Trustee appointed on behalf of all the natural resources damaged by the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, Commissioner Collinsworth regrets that he's unable to be here. He's chairing a meeting of the North Pacific Fishery Council, a long scheduled meeting in Anchorage. Uh, Mr. Collinsworth attended your hearing on March 22nd and submitted uh, testimony, and he requests that that t testimony be made a, a part of this record, if, uh, if that's possible. I'd like, Mr. Chairman, to uh, reiterate and supplement three points contained in the Commissioner's statement of March 22nd. First of all, uh, I th and it uh, goes to the point that uh, Mr. Olson and Mr. Adler made earlier, the sublethal injuries from the spill are probably the most insidious and the most important. Um, last month, Commissioner Collinsworth provided preliminary data from studies on peregrine falcons, herring, salmon, and uh, rockfish to illustrate the less obvious but potentially great damage to biological resources from the sublethal effects of the oil spill. These uh, examples attracted considerable attention, and I've uh, attached to my testimony an addendum uh, relating to those. Uh, that information. Uh, and they attracted so much attention that I think it overshadowed the major point, or one of the major points at least, of Commissioner's statement regarding these sublethal injuries. We've all seen the pictures of the oil spill, and it certainly riveted public attention. But how do you take a picture of a peregrine falcon chick that didn't get born because a nesting pair of, fer of peregrines were uh, uh, displaced from their normal nesting habitat. You, you don't take a picture of that. And yet those are the kinds of long-term damages that we think are perhaps the most important to address in trying to assess the damage from an oil spill of this nature or any nature. Exxon contends that because wildlife can be seen cavorting in Prince William Sound and because there's salmon in the salmon streams, uh, that everything is hunky-dory in uh, Prince William Sound. We don't think that's the case. Um, soon after Commissioner Collinsworth testified, Exxon initiated a series of advertisements saying that there are no long-term effects from the spill, unquote. Um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game considers this advertising unsupported 
by the scientific mm -hmm. evidence available to us, both from our ongoing scientific programs and from the programs that we've undertaken as a part of the natural resources damage assessment process. The second point in Commissioner Collinsworth's testimony that I'd like to focus on is that the public is clearly frustrated with the secrecy that has surrounded this process. And Mr. Chairman, the State of Alaska, the Governor of Alaska, and Commissioner Collinsworth, the trustee for Alaska, are frustrated with it too. The private plaintiffs clearly would like to see the information from the damage assessment process made public. The federal government would like to see the information from the damage proce assessment process made public. The question is Exxon. Uh, in October of 1989, the state proposed to Exxon that uh, data be made available to the public jointly. We uh, have not had a substantive response to that uh, proposal. On April 4th, the state and federal trustees jointly reiterated their proposal to Exxon that all damage assessment raw data be, uh, be deposited in a public repository. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, on behalf of uh, the state of Alaska, we would be very grateful Thanks, Craig. Uh, if there was anything this committee or members could do to uh, uh, encourage Exxon to make good on the public statements of their senior officers made months ago that they would like to see this data made public. Uh, I think many of the questions that have arisen today are the consequence uh, in the previous testimony are a consequence of, of simple misunderstanding of what's going on. And that's understandable. If the data is being kept secret, we'd like to see it made public. Final point that I'd like to reiterate and, and follow up on in, in Commissioner Collinsworth's initial testimony is that there is, in fact, uh, in our experience with this process of natural resources damage assessment, a fundamental flaw. The commissioner noted that the, the damage assessment process contains no mechanism for providing the funds to carry out the damage assessment work. Uh, today, we're even more concerned. While Alaska's legislature has fully supported the state's share of the work, the federal administration has not, as it has been previously pointed out, proposed any supplemental or regular budget appropriations for assessment of Exxon Valdez spill damages. Now, we think we have a good damage assessment program. And notwithstanding the criticisms that may have been voiced earlier, we think it's a program that will ensure a full and fair recovery, or at least give the, uh, lay the groundwork for a full and fair recovery of natural resources damages. Uh, the program is, uh, is not sharply reduced from the program that had been proposed or was carried out last year, and in fact uh, is budgeted to cost approximately 31 or 32 million dollars. Uh, but we're very concerned that this program actually get underway and in the field as planned. And as, as we sit here today, we have in some cases only a few weeks or only a few days to get certain projects underway, particularly the marine sampling programs that NOAA is undertaking and the coastal habitat uh, programs uh, and assessment that are being managed by the Department of Agriculture through the Forest Service. Uh, we're very concerned because many of the assessment studies done uh, elsewhere depend on information generated by those studies. And while we do not know in the state uh, government the, uh, the precise status of uh, federal funding concerns, we do know that the people who are responsible for getting this research underway are at a high level of anxiety for and, and seem to be working under a great deal of uncertainty as to where the money for that process is coming from. We're concerned really in two ways. That, that's the first one, that, that programs that have been approved by the trustees and are ready to go are not getting going forward because it appears that the federal agencies are being forced to uh, scrounge around in their budgets to find money to carry out this, uh, this uh, program by reducing activities and other ongoing programs. And that brings us to our second concern. We believe that important programs of interest both to Alaska and the rest of the nation in terms of resource management uh, may be sacrificed in order to carry out the federal obligations on the damage assessment process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 
um, I'd be happy to address any questions the committee may have. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Harrison. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm Mel Harrison, Executive Vice President of Exxon Company USA, and with me is Dr. Al Mackey, as you mentioned, who's a senior environmental specialist who has managed uh, our environmental studies. I appeared before this uh, subcommittee on March 22nd, 1990, and filed my statement at that time and, and made a discussion of a number of topics. Now, with your permission, uh, I'll reiterate just a very few points that were included in that statement. <clears throat> Exxon believes that an NRDA, or Natural Resource Damage Assessment process, is most effective when the parties cooperatively work together to assess the damage and restoration possibilities. Initially, Exxon anticipated such a cooperative process. It was willing and prepared to work with the trustee agencies. The process has not worked as we anticipated. The trustees and the agencies early on appear to have given priority to potential gains via litigation and have allowed their attorneys to, to have much control over the process. The resulting breakdown in cooperation, in our view, was unnecessary and was premature. Unfortunately, restoration interest and needs appear to have taken a back seat. Exxon remains interested in working with the trustees if a satisfactory framework could be developed for a cooperative approach and if the opportunity exists for mutually agreed solutions. Now, in the interval since March 22nd, uh, Battelle Ocean Re Sciences has published the results of an investigation into the water quality in Prince William Sound. And I have submitted uh, copies of this study for the record. Uh, now, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Mackey and I would be pleased to answer any questions that this committee may have. <clears throat> I thank you very much. Mr. Harrison, why, uh, why has uh, Exxon not yet agreed to, uh, to funding the, the $20 million differential between the $15 million uh, that was initially put up by Exxon and the $35 million have been spent in the last, last year? Well, but, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, we uh, very early on uh, signed a memorandum of agreement with the trustees, and under that memorandum of agreement, we had agreed to fund uh, $15 million and to consider request for additional funding uh, at an appropriate time. The terms of that memorandum of agreement have not been lived up to. Uh, under the provisions of the memorandum of agreement, Exxon was to participate in the design, the development and design of the scope of those, uh, of those plans. Uh, we have not been given the opportunity to participate. We know very little about the studies. What we do know about them does not give us comfort. We, uh, we saw the plan that was originally filed. We submitted our comments on the plan. We have not heard from those comments. We have not seen a final plan uh, submitted. So we have no basis to understand the studies in such a way to justify additional funding. That's with now, respect. You have not seen any of the studies that have been completed in the last year. The, this no, is, sir. This is for work that has been been completed in the last year. Is that correct? Work that's been completed, and even that amount that's been funded by the fifteen million dollars we did advance. Where does the request by the trustees to submit all the scientific evidence to 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 comment to a common pool, if you will, or a common forum uh, for an investigation? Where does that uh, stand with Exxon? That was made in January. We have not replied to that. We do plan to reply. We do plan to uh, suggest that uh, and accept their invitation to meet to discuss the uh, discuss that issue. The uh, that is not a uh, simple uh, proposal. It's uh, very complex. Why is that? And, well, there are uh, uh, questions involving the definitions of what is data, and uh, in their own proposals, they admit that that's one of the most difficult things to decide. So, what kind of things do you suspect would be withheld by the? state or the federal studies, the trustee studies? That's something that I think needs discussed among the parties as to what, you know, what is proposed and what would be the data to be filed. 
having run for office eight times, this reminds me of when you want to not debate your opponent. You meet and confer until the, until the election has come and gone. That request was sent when? Initially in October. In October? The state made that proposal in October, Mr. Chairman. And then there was a joint request made when? Uh, uh, the joint request uh, formally was uh, forwarded on April 4th. Uh, I think it was informally forwarded earlier. Were there any discussions, Mr. Harrison, between Exxon and the state? On their, We've on not their replied to that. There have been some discussions. And in fact, I think uh, this, this entire uh, uh, proposal uh, deserves a little bit of background on the, uh, on the amount of data that's been furnished and uh, the process that, has, has, uh, that we've gone through. Not only did, uh, have we not uh, been able to get the data from the studies that we funded and the studies that uh, were, uh, were, were to be furnished to us under the memorandum of agreement, but from the start, we had visualized a cooperative process. There was, in fact, a science committee that was established there very early on. And in that science committee, we discussed the studies to be proposed, to be conducted. We discussed the protocols under which those studies would be conducted. We visualized a cooperative scientific approach where the scientists would get together, would agree upon what was needed, and the studies would be conducted, and a, and a need for restoration determined. And those, those meetings initially ran uh, daily, and, uh, and we laid out our study proposals. We shared with the other scientists their study proposals. So much data was furnished. On May the 26th, we wrote a letter after having tried uh, uh, quite frequently to expand the process of exchange of data to the trustees. In that, uh, in that letter, we laid out the studies we were conducting. We not only laid them out, but we named the contractors and the scientists that were doing the studies for us. A pretty complete disclosure, I might submit. And, uh, and we've not yet heard from that letter. We've not, we've not received an answer to, the, to, to our proposals at that time. So there is a great deal of background on which we have furnished significant amounts of data, including the, uh, the uh, water quality study that I've just uh, uh, filed for the record today. This is an executive summary of that particular study. The actual report is, uh, is, is quite thick, quite voluminous, and reports, uh, reports uh, upon the data that was collected and the results that were analyzed. You just stated that, that you, uh, on, the, uh, on the, the draft plan for the, uh, for the environmental assessments that were done during 1989, that, that you had commented on those. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Because in the, uh, if I read this correctly, the Department of Interior in their uh, uh, statement by Mr. Uh, Sidberg, associate solicitor, he says that numerous comments were received by the trustees and in December of last year additional opportunities for oral presentations was provided to those who had, pre pre uh, who had previously submitted written comments. Neither Exxon nor Exxon Shipping availed itself of that opportunity. You were in the, where you, you commented when? We made our comments within the 30-day period that we were uh, we were given to respond to those. Uh, so he's referring he's reasons. referring to to the uh, uh, after uh, after we the plan was uh, submitted and uh, comments were uh, were solicited. We filed our comments and at a later date, there was a hearing held, an opportunity for an oral discussion. Our uh, filing was quite complete, and uh, and we felt like we had uh, we had filed our comments and uh, fully disclosed our comments at that time, and we had nothing further to offer. So we did not appear at the, uh, at the oral uh, discussion. And then what happened? We've heard nothing. But the plan went, the plan went forward. We don't, uh, we don't have any information. We've heard nothing as far as uh, any adjustments to the plan, uh, the, the uh, initial plan that was proposed. We don't know what adjustments were made in response to the comments that we made, nor that numerous other people made. The initial plan was widely, very roundly criticized. 
and a number of suggestions we received, but we have no idea what, uh, what the response to those proposals were. Let me uh, 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 ask you uh, if you can then, and you just responded to my question, but let me ask you if you can elaborate. What is, uh, what is your current understanding of Exxon's position both with respect to uh, the, the joint disclosure of, uh, of scientific data and, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the 20 million dollars shortfall between the cost of the, the studies and, and the money that you initially provided? I think both of those requests are involved in the process, get involved. It's the, the overall process is the, the fundamental thing that's, uh, that we're discussing. And, and as I mentioned before, we do plan to respond. We do propose to meet and discuss those issues. The, the, uh, there was a comment made earlier that about Exxon. Uh, 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 it's up to Exxon or something to that effect. Actually, uh, we've made quite a bit of our data available, and um, and uh, trustees certainly can make their data available. They don't need Exxon, and uh, so I don't consider it's up to Exxon. Now, however, we uh, we are prepared to meet. We are prepared to discuss these particular issues. We cannot justify advancing an additional $20 million with no knowledge of what studies have been done, what the justification was. There are certain criteria, certain bases for which the, uh, the trustees have an obligation uh, to, uh, to meet uh, uh, in the conduct of these studies. Many of the studies as we saw them initially laid out were directed toward things that we don't think were damaged. In fact, it looked like there was a list of all the natural resources that you could imagine stacked up regardless of the impact of damage, and we'll do a study. Now, some of those studies in the, uh, in the, in the regulations. Was that, was that in fact done? I don't know what's been done. You don't know at all? And they have no information on the studies that were conducted. Mr. Mackey, do you? Very little information. Do you have any information? All we have is what the public document showed, the list of 72 studies which we commented on last fall. We have indications that some of those have been considered for termination, others modified, but the specifics are unavailable to us. And we only received that have any evidence from to the support, public. Do you have any evidence to support that a lot of studies were done that, uh, that you didn't believe were necessary? We don't have information on the specifics of studies, but the listing of studies indicated species and areas that we, our own information indicate are of minimal concern or were not injured in the spill. How many of those species and areas are different from the studies that Exxon's undertaken? There are a number of studies in the trustee plan that are indeed different than what we are doing now. How many are the same? There is a considerable degree of overlap also. Is there more overlap than there is difference? We're conducting in, in 1989, just to, to give you the background on how we're organized. Very early after this spill, in the first week in fact, we mobilized field program to assess and design, design studies to develop data on the chemical fate and concentrations of hydrocarbons in the various environmental compartments. These studies, each one was complemented by, by biological studies to look at the biological effects in these respective compartments. So our studies were carefully designed to provide complementary data on chemical fate and biological effects on either side. We mobilized last summer and still have on board a crew of well over 300 researchers, field crew, technicians, and experts with national and indeed international reputations on oil pollution research. These people are advising us on our studies, conducting and helping in the design of the programs. In, in so doing, we think we've mobilized the largest ever program of this magnitude to that's, look at oil spill response. That's 300 total individuals? Over 300 total researchers, technicians, and individuals involved. To date, we've de generated data on over 40,000 individual samples, biological samples, water quality samples, uh, and wildlife observations. These data provide us a very solid basis 
to uh, quantify the level of impacts on the respective environmental compartments. Uh, I think you refer to our Exhibit B, wherein we shared initial results of some of those studies with you, submitted in, in March. <laughs> the uh, previous, uh, uh, no, I, I, excuse me, uh, uh, Mr. Erickson uh, mentioned concern, I, I believe it was him that mentioned concern about uh, uh, water sampling studies that, that, that NOAA is, is considering conducting. Are those sampling studies being conducted by, uh, by Exxon? We have a very major water quality program underway the results of which were submitted to you in a report authored by Battelle's investigators. That study is a typical example of the magnitude and level of effort we have underway in our respective programs. What's the significance of that study? The program that is detailed in that report details data from the largest water quality investigation yet conducted on oil spill pollution research. There's over 2,300 samples have been taken and analyzed. The data is conclusive through last October in that report. The bottom line of that data indicate that the major water compartment of Prince William Sound was not polluted to major extent during the spill itself. The levels consistently throughout spring and fall have been well below the state of Alaska or federal water quality standards designed to protect aquatic life. The bottom line of that study is simply, if you didn't dose the ecosystem, you don't expect a major biological response. The water column itself provides the main area for fish propagation, fish feeding, zooplankton ecology, a number of the other studies you heard mentioned earlier today. We've got complementary biological data and observations on the respective components and compartments of the biological system that provide us a good picture of the, of the lack of substantive effects on the key ecological species in the sound. What are the studies that allow you to, uh, to state as you do in, in your ads that uh, scientific data show that Prince William Sound pink salmon in 1990 are healthy and thriving and not been significantly affected by last year's oil spill? If you'd like, I have a, have a poster board where we could... You can just tell me. Okay, we can walk through this study. First, let's look at the, at the ecology of pink salmon. Unlike the other five Pacific salmon, the pink salmon has a two-year life cycle. Last, last spring, during the, the major concentrations of hydrocarbons in the sound, we looked at the first piece of the life cycle. These were the eggs and young that were spawned in the streams in the intertidal areas in the fall of 1988, prior to the spill. These individuals were still in the streams. We launched a field program to look at the, these are called out-migrants, to look at the young. We found data that these individuals did indeed leave the stream and enter into the estuarine environment. We then looked at their potential to survive in the environment. We did live cage. These are live car uh, tests supported by uh, toxicological evidence. Simply supporting fish in a cage in a number of oiled and unoiled bays, looking at survival of this very sensitive juvenile life stage. We found no difference between those oiled and unoiled areas. Following further through the life cycle in the summer, Looking at adult escapement, this now is the, is the returning year class, we, we found extensive utilization of streams in both oiled and unoiled areas. Spawning was, was indeed occurring throughout the sound. Following now, subsequently throughout the fall and winter, looking at the eggs and the young that were produced in that spawning, we've developed quantitative data from streams in oiled, unoiled sites looking at eggs, the hatch and the development of eggs buried in containers taken from several oil and unoil sites give us very reassuring information that there's no difference in survival of these young eggs and very sensitive young from those areas. Similarly now we're, we're looking at the, the following life cycle in 1990. So we followed through essentially one year of the life cycle to date and it provides us very convincing evidence that uh, Indeed, the pink salmon population has not been severely impacted. And that, was put on, those that was on a range of, of, uh, of, st of streams, what degree of, of impact by the oil? Okay, you have to put the stream question in the proper context. There are over 500 
separate spawning streams cataloged in Prince William Sound salmon streams. Approximately 100 of these streams are in the southwest corner of the Sound, the potentially impacted area. Now, looking at the population dynamics of the pink salmon catch, about 10 percent of the catch for 1988 and 89 was due to native stock. The vast majority came from hatchery propagated stock. There are five hatcheries in Prince William Sound, each introducing eggs. Let's put it in the con let's put it in the context of of the, the degree to which these uh, these areas were were oiled. Right. Whether they were heavily oiled, or moderately oiled, lightly oiled, or unoiled. The streams we're looking at are typically lightly oiled. We are unable to find any heavily oiled salmon streams per se. They just simply don't exist. Is that we correct, have Mr. Erickson? Uh, that is not supported by our, our information. What's your information? Mr. Chairman, um, the trustee's responsibility is to get a full and fair damage recovery. And to that end, the attorneys have told us that we, they don't think that they can get us a full and fair damage recovery unless we have a level playing field with Exxon vis-a-vis -vis the information here. And they've asked us not to to uh, make this information available. Um, I don't have the, uh, the information but, uh, at hand, but <coughs> frankly, uh, I think that the Commissioner Collinsworth would be prepared to make it available to this committee, uh, and I'll take that request uh, back to him, notwithstanding the attorney's uh, concerns about that. Uh, Commissioner Collinsworth's testimony uh, previously with respect to, to heavily oiled streams, wasn't there testimony submitted to the committee? Well, uh, I don't think he differentiated in his testimony between heavily oiled and lightly oiled, although I noticed that uh, Exxon did in their advertisement. Um, Mr. Collinsworth stated that um, um, in the intertidal portion of some salmon streams where we would normally find tens of thousands of eggs or juvenile forms, our biologists have been unable to find even a single egg, alvin, or fry. Now, that was accurate at the time that that statement was made. Since then, the more extensive uh, sampling efforts under our NRDA process have uh, discovered many eggs and fry. But uh, we still are quite concerned about the impacts of oil on the salmon uh, resource. And I think it is is just, I guess I, I find it hard to, to see how we can make conclusions about a resource of this nature, a biological resource of this nature, after what amounts to a really very cursory period of study. You don't, you don't rule out damages to, to, from a substance as complex as oil in a natural environment as rich and as, as complex as Prince William Sound on the basis of a few samples or even a lot of samples taken over a short period of time. In order to assess these damages, it's going to take a long period of painstaking scientific research. And uh, if Exxon wants to see the results of our science research, uh, we'll be happy to make it available to them as soon as we have that level playing field. Uh, and if, if, if there's some complexities about data here, if they want to uh, only uh, disclose data gathered by a blue-eyed uh, fisheries biologist on an odd Tuesday, uh, we'll, we'll be glad to do that. I mean, at least we'll get some of it out. Uh, the, the public needs to know about about what's really going on and not be forced to rely on this kind of information for that. Let me, uh, uh, it would be helpful to the committee if, if that information could, uh, uh, could be made available. Uh, but further in the ad, you go on to say, studies reveal no short-term or long-term impact on this, uh, on this species. How did you determine that? Long-term measured through at least the year life cycle that we've carried it through. The potential for impact is very encouraging. We're simply not seeing data that would indicate we've substantially harmed the resource. The data for that year. For the year class, that's correct. Now you have to look at, again, getting to the stream story. Those 100 streams account for about 10 percent of the salmon production in Prince William Sound. Yeah. The, 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 all of the native production, the 600 streams that are referred to, account for about 10 percent. The one-sixth of those streams in the oiled area represent an even smaller percentage. So if we had major impacts in those limited streams, still the population would not be substantively impacted. We'd be in a fractional percentage area. 
So by virtue of its size, what are you saying? By virtue of its size, you're saved? By virtue of its size, we don't think that there has been a, an impact in the, in the uh, commercial salmon take. You have to look at the biology. Let's look at the returns. Okay. In 1988, there were 29 million fish taken in the common property yeah. harvest. In 1980, uh, well, let's see, 87, oh. that was 29. In, 80, in 88, that went down to 11 million fish. You see a tremendous fluctuation of one, one and a half to twofold in natural biological variability in the life cycle of these fish occurring. We don't think we're listen, going to be I, able listen, to discern I appreciate, the impact. I appreciate the arguments you're making, uh, and, and uh, um, they will serve you well, I assume. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm haunted by uh, uh, one of your colleagues in the oil industry. When you go into their cafeteria, has a very large aquarium. Uh, where they run the affluent through that they run into San Francisco Bay and they have they have trout in there Lord. They're very proud of those trout That those trout live and thrive in the affluent one day. They rolled up belly up After a long term of two or three years Which trout we're doing right now. I don't know why they did that it could have been the cleaning lady for all I know it could but, have been. Uh, yeah. uh, but we don't think so <laughs> okay, <laughs> but uh, okay. uh, uh Well, we realize our data will be scrutinized at all levels, and for that reason, we've assembled well, some of the best salmon how biologists. Be, how will your data be scrutinized at all levels? Both in peer review and legal and several. What kind, of, what kind of peer review has your data been scrutinized by so far? Well, to date, we've had very little peer review or little opportunity to share our information with the state and federal agencies. We did in this last summer. You have every through, opportunity. You've just chosen not to do it. Through last summer, we took every opportunity to share our data daily with the agencies. The science committee that Mr. Harrison referred to met at 7 o'clock every night at the Valdez Civic Auditorium. Right. We met to share our data. Every one of our contractors and our researchers was encouraged to attend and did indeed attend daily what to share the results your, of our... What peer review has your data had to date that you've made, the, the, that this ad is based on? The peer review of our internal investigators who uh, we will uh, put up against the best in the world. These are investigators from a number of universities, uh, uh, well-renowned nationally and internationally. And to date, they're all on your payroll? To date, they are our contractors. Right. Yes, sir. I guess what, uh, 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 what concerns me uh, and you heard my discussion with, with the first panel that we're, we're, we're drifting into uh, what I believe is, uh, for the moment, a dream scenario for Exxon. That if you can keep the debate going long enough, uh, the point at which, at which studies can be constructed, other than your own, because you have obviously very, very deep pockets at this point, uh, uh, Point which studies can be constructed and 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 uh, and, be, and be valuable both in our long-term understanding and in the in the courtroom uh, uh, is, is is getting more and more more limited in that uh, in, the, in that process. Uh, also, the extent to which uh, 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 the debate can be continued <clears throat> it would assume, it would assume to me that if I was the uh, if I was the attorney general. Uh, I don't know that my case is getting any stronger. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, as I've said repeatedly since last April, we will make our case on the best science available and stand on that basis. I just want to make, I'm just trying to determine whether or not the public's going to get the same right. That's the purpose of these hearings. There's no doubt that you will do that, Mr. Mackey, but the, the question is what is the interest of the public in this, uh, uh, in this, in this process? And, and to date, it's not, it's not very clear that that's being very well served. And, uh, uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, you know, out of game, just, we've said it, but we did offer these data nightly. We did anticipate cooperation. We did lay out the uh, contractors doing our work. We did want to discuss the protocols. We did, we did make, we did offer to make our data available. We were making it available. Now we're caught in a process to where very early in those science committees, the other side was directed not to furnish data, not discuss. It was not our doing. 
Now we're caught in the data where, where we're asked to fund studies that we don't know what they're doing. We know nothing about the studies. We don't see the data, we don't see the information, and we have been sued. Do you think you were not going to be sued? Well, we set out to cooperatively work the process and to, to, to then, then uh, uh, clean up the beaches, make payments for the damages voluntarily, handle the restoration needs voluntarily. We anticipated being able to work that out. Now, certainly we anticipated suits. We've got numerous suits of a private nature, and we're also uh, uh, seeking to deal with those. And we've settled many, many private claims. We think we've, we're paying all those claims uh, voluntarily of, uh, of every claim that we think is uh, soundly based. We're paying them voluntarily. Smacky, let me ask you, uh, uh, on the question of, of the recovery of, of uh, wildlife, What's, what's your what's your understanding of uh, uh, the extent of the harm here? Is it is it to is it to wildlife actually recovered, or how do you, what do you what do your scientists tell you in terms of uh, well, our field observations to date are very encouraging that uh, the wildlife species most visibly impacted, of course, the sea otter population and the bird population, are indeed on the rapid road to recovery in Prince William Sound's most heavily impacted areas. I was in the Sound most recently last week, and it's quite encouraging just simply to observe the eagles in even Bay of Isles, Snug Harbor, Northwest Bay, Sleepy Bay, the bays most heavily impacted and most commonly referred to in spill impact data. These all have very good populations of sea otters and eagles a number of waterfowl are present. We are encouraged by the, the recolonization that has occurred in these areas. Well, I don't mean to trivialize the impacts. Indeed, it's regrettable that we did have mortalities last year. The statistics have been well published on bird and otter mortalities, and uh, we understand that perfectly well. But I do want to point out that, indeed, restoration is well underway. But is it more extensive than, less extensive than the uh, statistics that have been, been published? Is the, is the body count the extent of the, uh, of the damage or the harm? It'll be a, uh, a statistical exercise to ultimately determine the extent of impacts to birds and sea otters. We fully recognize that our restoration uh, or the recovery and rehabilitation program from last summer did not indeed collect all of the mortalities from the spill. As you're, as you're well aware, we organize the most extensive search and rescue and rehabilitation program for both birds and sea otters that also has ever been attempted. That Which program indeed uh, did recover sea otters, restore sea otters, and get them back into the environment. Similarly with birds. We had a very good success ratio. Our bird release and treatment ratio was about 50 percent. The sea otters were about 62 percent brought into the center's release. What's your, what's your, uh, uh, your impression of the, the most recent uh, discussion that's taking place with respect to whether or not uh, the otter population, in fact, uh, survived the extent to which we previously had thought it did, or whether or not they're now starting to, uh, to perish or have, in fact, perished those that were tagged? Well, I think we share the, uh, the statements made by Fish and Wildlife Service uh, researchers and, and administration that indicate it's too early to interpret from that limited sample of radio tagged otters exactly what a population level might have been. However, we are very much encouraged again by our own field observations that indicate otters are indeed present and have colonized areas that were heavily impacted. So essentially what, what you're saying with respect to, uh, uh, to, to, to eagles and, and falcons and, and otters and, uh, and the salmon is that uh, it would seem to me what you're, what you're, what you're saying is, is that this system is so large that it essentially survived this, uh, this oil spill. I think ultimately that data will, no will certainly indicate that. With no long-term damage. With, uh, with no significant long-term impacts. If you simply review the literature of other spills from around the world or talk to other experts who have extensively investigated these areas, you can see that the literature clearly document a, a re recovery of, of ecosystems in a relatively short time following oil spills of this magnitude. 
you can get down to, uh, to even the more less visible or less popular species like the, uh, the snails, the invertebrates, and the intertidal species that occupy the most heavily impacted zones, that is the shorelines, that were indeed the focus of our shoreline cleaning program last summer. Even in these systems now, we're documenting a high recovery as now we begin to extend our photo period and the Alaskan spring is underway. We now have over 16 hour daylight. We're now beginning to see the productivity of the ecosystem at these very base levels, including snails, clams, small intertidal invertebrates growing and reproducing as uh, you would expect them to at this time of year. So essentially this can, this can uh this is like a prize fight. You can, you can get knocked unconscious, but you can come back in a sense here. If you're strong the, enough, you can... Uh, the literature do indeed, does indeed accurately document that the resiliency of marine inter intertidal ecosystems is indeed significant. How many, uh, uh, how many otters have uh, died, according to your science? The uh, official toll taken by Fish and Wildlife Service is 1,016. These are the auto carcasses documented now. Is that a result of the oil spill? We, I think, you, you everyone, refer in your testimony everyone agrees that not all of those otters taken in were oiled or were the direct result of, uh, of mortalities due to the oil. You have to review the literature there, and you'll find uh, that uh, investigations in Prince William Sound have documented in spring at this time of year as much as, uh, or as many as one otter per linear mile of shoreline as natural mortality. This na naturally occurs every spring. It's been, it's been suggested uh, uh, recently that, uh, uh, that some of the treated, uh, uh, treated otters may in fact be carrying uh, viruses into, into other parts of the population. Have you taken a, have your scientists <laughs> taken a look at that or have you yeah, we did. Uh, in fact, that was very troubling last summer when uh, those rumors were abounding, and indeed that uh, that inhibited the release of some of our sea otters back into the wild. What was it? Can you just explain? Give me some background on that. The concerns were that otters held in captivity in in areas around humans had the potential to pick up things like distemper and some of the more common diseases uh, mm -hmm. that uh, vertebrates do get exposed to in those kind of systems. The concern was then that upon release, these individuals may introduce canine distemper or other diseases into the natural population. I should point out that our otter program had uh, a number of veterinarians, PhDs, and researchers carefully looking at the health, daily documenting the health records of these animals, and there was no evidence of any systemic or in endemic uh, infection in, in any of our data. And that's true a year I mean, now, when you look at it a year later, as far as you know? As far as I know, however, our data obviously are limited. We're not out sampling otters for uh, distemper. Mr. Harrison, what, uh, with, with the new uh, fishing season coming up and, and the sensitivity of, of Alaska, obviously, to the quality of its salmon and, it, and its reputation and, and the whole marketing uh, impact on that. I guess the, my understanding is, and, and Mr. Erickson, you may address this, but that there's, there, there's going to be some determinations uh, made later this year about various seasons that may or may not be open and, and areas that may or may not. Is that still under active consideration by the state? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, the state has what has become known as a zero tolerance policy, which essentially tries to assure that consumers of Alaska seafood can have absolute assurance that there will be no contamination of the product and uh, that policy dictates that uh, any evidence whatsoever of, uh, of uh, contamination or potential con contamination is, is treated uh, extremely seriously and that the, the fisheries will be closed as necessary to ensure that no, uh, no product, uh, to make doubly sure that no contaminated product enters commerce. What's, uh, what's Exxon's approach to this going to be? Uh, obviously, this is going to have an economic impact on people who, what do they do? Do they just continue through the claims process, or do you recognize these? Uh, this is, uh, is, is an extension of the damages of the, of the spill a year ago? Uh, we basically see no, uh, no reason for closing. We, uh, the water quality study that uh, Dr. Mackey mentioned uh, and discussed would suggest there is no reason for closings. The, uh, of course, the herring fishing uh, in Prince William Sound season here just recently uh, 
Uh, in 20 minutes, caught 7,100 tons and exceeded their goal substantially, and uh, no problems there. We've offered to conduct some uh, fishing in areas of concern, some testing. We've, and uh, so we basically see no reason. Okay. For, now let's uh, let's assume closure. a reason. Let's assume a reason does arise in the in the eyes of the uh, of the state. Uh, obviously, uh, just like you you understand what marketing means. Uh, you you what you're saying is essentially that that it'll be your position that that's not related. That's a, that's a, that's an independent determination by we'll, the state. We'll look at that reason. The uh, recently there was uh, announced some uh, some concerns, and each time we've investigated them, we've uh, we've uh, we found uh, found that there was no problem. There was some bottom dwelling fish recently uh, reported to have oil on them, and uh, further investigation indicated there was no oil. That's true. That was, the, sh the shrimp, the shrimp also. The shrimp, uh, we we could not identify that 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 oil that was on the rope, which I saw those rope. I looked at the oil, and it was. Uh, it was very, very small amounts of oil on there. Where it came from, I do, I do not know, but we've not been able to determine that that came from uh, from the Valdez spill. And uh, we don't see that that would have caused any reason for it. So the, uh, uh, we're, now, we're now getting... <laughs> well, I'm, I, I'm I, not. I appreciate your, 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 your attempts to limit liability. That's your job. But we're, we, we, could, we would now, what, expect that ownership of the oil would have to be proven? No, no in this particular case, I didn't mean... Uh, in this case... Uh, there wasn't enough oil or significance there to see that there would be any uh, any reason. And I and I and you know, I, good I don't know. Good restaurants have lost their well, business because people found a single human hair in their food well, or a cockroach in their soup. I don't know that there's a difference of opinion in so far as this pot sh pot shrimp goes. I'm you know after the investigations and looking at it. I'm no, not, I understand. I'm just I'm saying, but sure the, but this uh, obviously uh, uh, it is a contingency that is being planned for. You're talking about a, a, a multi-billion-dollar industry over over a reasonable period of time uh, that has to protect itself, and I'm just questioning the, the there there is the, there is the potential this uh, uh, this summer for uh, for an economic downside for for some fishermen. I just wonder if that's within the uh, the sphere of uh, of liability uh, from this spill or or, or it isn't. I don't expect you to I don't expect you to write a check here, Mr. Harris. I'm just asking. <laughs> <clears throat> We're going to look at each one of those claims and deal with them uh, reasonably and uh, on the basis of whether we've got a liability for them or not. What will it take to get uh, to get Exxon to come forward with its uh, with its research and its mm -hmm. and its data and throw it into the uh, to the common uh, the common pool? What's your what's your requirement? Well, we need to talk with the uh, the other trustees about this to see that this uh, whole proposal that. is workable. What's your, what's your requirement? Is, is workable. I don't know that it's workable, system. And uh, so uh, is it workable at all? We have data. One of the things that you, you, ha you have to have is all the data needs to go into all right. any kind of a proposal, including not just the trustees' data, but all the go other government regulatory agencies that gather a significant amount of data in data in this particular area. I mean, the fishing groups and the other, you know, a large number of regulatory agencies. So you need all the data. Now, data also has very little util utilization to someone unless they know the protocols, the place where it was taken, the, uh, and it's, 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 it's really not usable. I, we can uh, show you data in columns of numbers and numbers and numbers, and they can, they can be as misused because they're not fully explained. So there's a, there's a question of workability on this, uh, on this proposal. And, uh, and, and there's a question of whether we're talking about all the data or not, and how are we going to put it into the, uh, into the uh, system? I mean, right now it exists on various times of computer systems. How are you going to get that data into a system? And is it better left where it is and access given to, you, to it where it is? I'm not sure we're dealing here with a practical problem here, um, but it's something we're willing to talk about and see if there is. A Why don't I feel very comfortable with that response? <laughs> uh, 
Well, Mr. Chairman, I think it's symptomatic of the, of the issue that uh, this is the first opportunity we've had to, to even uh, meet Mr. Erickson. And uh, we don't feel that a congressional subcommittee is in place to uh, be dealing and airing alternate sides of the issue. In a more communicative and more cooperative context, we feel we could have a much more productive and, uh, and uh, cooperative. Well, it is a proper form because we still, as, as you heard uh, uh, in the earlier testimony, uh, some people are suggesting that we go ahead and, and fund yes. uh, uh, this data. Yes. And, a, and, and a question is, is, uh, is for the moment, at least $20 million. And, and if we're going to do future, maybe 30. We're now at $55 million. Uh, and that may grow to be 90 and $100 million. And so it's a very pertinent question. Yep. And uh, having committed one of the great eco ecological crimes of the century, whether or not you can be helpful in, 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 mm -hmm. in, in putting together a protocol that will benefit the public, and whether or not you will participate in the solution to this problem is a very legitimate question for this committee. And if the state is at fault, and or the federal agencies are at fault, or the Department of Justice, or Exxon, is a matter of, for inquiry of this committee. Because at some point, for the first time in maybe a decade or so, the American people would like to see that perhaps justice is done, not vengeance. Vengeance is different. That's not what this committee is about. But the notion that we made our best effort that's exactly what this inquiry is about. So the question of whether or not uh, 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 there is a means by which uh, your scientific data and research can be accessed, and whether or not it, it, will, it will move us toward a resolution, a solution, a, a, a opportunities to, uh, to, to remedy this situation is, is becomes necessary is very relevant. Okay. Just as the question is to Mr. Erickson. I mean, if they're hiding behind your bad PR, so that they don't have to submit their, uh, their data. I mean, God bless them. You've given them a huge shield, but that's not their right. And the same goes for, the same goes for the other agencies. By the same token, if you're dragging your feet in the best nature of uh, the Paris peace talks and presidential debates so the crucial deadlines and datelines and baselines will be removed from discussion, that's not your right either. And I'm a, I'm a little concerned that maybe a little of both is going on here. There's nothing like delay in court. And as someone who has a fairly important court date, I'm a little concerned that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that litigation is starting to overwhelm the public interest here with respect to, uh, to the resolution. It may, it may very well be that when, when this committee has the ability to look at your, your reports and, and, and other scientists' comments on it and reviews by whomever, that, that we may determine that, uh, that your, your conclusions with respect to the pink salmon are, in fact, correct. And that your, your, your conclusions with respect to the plankton are, in fact, correct. But all we have now is Exxon say. I would suspect that Exxon, if you're so confident, you would, would like to have that verified on, 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 some, other, on, on some other basis. But that's, again, that's your choice. And you've, you've made so many wise PR decisions in the last year that I don't want to interfere with, uh, with, that, uh, with that process. <clears throat> but that is the inquiry of this, uh, of, this, of this committee. And what I hear right now is that uh, we should not expect that there'll be any participation by Exxon in the $20 million. So that's a decision the federal government's going to have to make, whether they're going to go to the taxpayers and get the $20 million for, uh, for necessary studies as a result of this oil spill. And two, that we can expect that there will be a long continued uh, legal debate uh, over whether or not uh, there will be shared uh, scientific data, uh, studies, and, uh, and research, uh, which we will temporarily conclude probably will not uh, best suit the, uh, the general public, but will certainly best suit the, uh, the attorneys on, uh, on, on all sides. But again, that's, uh, that's all sides. That's your rights as, as plaintiffs and defendants. Those are your rights. You're free to exercise them. They just may happen to collide at this moment with the, uh, with the best interest of the environment and the, uh, and the best interest of, uh, of, of the public in terms of uh, resolving this, uh, this issue. So we'll leave it there. You can continue to debate and discuss if this committee can, uh, can be helpful. Mr. Erickson, the, the data that you mentioned would be helpful if you would submit that to the, uh, 
uh, to the committee. Thank you very much for your testimony. The next panel will be made up of, uh, the committee we'll hear, hear from will be made up of uh, Mr. Richard Stewart, who is the Assistant Attorney General for Land and Natural Resources Division, Department of Justice, Alan Rawl, the General Counsel, Department of Agriculture, Martin Suberg, who is the Associate Solicitor of the Conservation Wildlife, and uh, Mr. Thomas Campbell, the General Counsel, National Oceanic Atmosphere Administration. Welcome to the, uh, uh, to the committee. I guess before you sit down, you might as well stand up and, and we can get you uh, uh, sworn. It is the practice of this uh, subcommittee to swear all witnesses who appear before it at investigative hearings. Do you have any objections to being sworn? Do you saw, do you raise your right hand, if you will, please. Do you solemnly swear to and affirm that, that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Collectively, you do. In order to inform you of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations on the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives and the committee are on the table in front of you. Both sets of rules have been previously provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you desire to be represented by counsel, counsel? No. I assume that that's a no from everyone at the table. Uh, thank you. Mr. Stewart, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I submit, obviously, my prepared testimony for the, uh, for the record and, and be uh, brief in what uh, I have to say uh, to open with. Uh, as the Chairman knows, uh, I am constrained in uh, discussing certain matters by the fact that we do have a criminal prosecution pending in this matter and uh, civil, uh, potential civil litigation uh, down, the, uh, down the road. I do want to make clear uh, that the Department of Justice is fully committed to pursuing all available legal remedies uh, in this case, uh, to punish whatever criminal conduct was involved in the spill, to secure damages, recover costs, and take all other measures necessary to ensure uh, and fund the recovery of the uh, damaged resources. We will As you know, uh, we are pressing forward with our criminal prosecution against uh, Exxon Corp and Exxon Shipping. Uh, indictment of 10 counts was returned. The defendants have been arraigned. A trial date has provisionally been set for June, although I expect the defendants will move for a uh, continuance under the Speedy Trial Act uh, because this is a complex uh, litigation. Uh, we pursue a conviction convictions on all counts and seek the fullest uh, amount of sanctions that the law allows. Uh, we are also considering potential civil litigation uh, to recover damages for the natural resources injured by the spill and other appropriate civil remedies. We intend to initiate such litigation when a case is ripe and appropriate in filing. A uh, key element in any such case would be to determine uh, the amount of natural resource damage to the fish, birds, marine mammals, and other resources in Prince William Sound and adjacent uh, uh, areas. And we are working closely with uh, my colleagues here at the table, uh, the federal trustee agencies, uh, in that effort. Uh, they are undertaking uh, the studies to determine the amount of damages uh, and obviously the specifics uh, of the plans and their conduct are their responsibility. We are trying to uh, provide some coordination with uh, uh, pending and uh, future uh, litigation. Uh, we have in this effort been working uh, uh, closely with the state of Alaska, uh, which has uh, its own litigation that it's been pursuing. Uh, obviously, there are uh, important joint interests uh, in the damage assessment process. Uh, we have, uh, since last summer, uh, been coordinating uh, that activity with the state. Uh, there are projects that have been agreed upon for the current season, uh, and those are moving forward. Uh, so that uh, on that side of it, uh, we've had effective uh, working uh, cooperation. Uh, we have also uh, uh, been discussing with the state the conduct of economic damage studies that would be part of civil litigation. Uh, the state has been pursuing some of its own studies, 
Uh, we are pursuing ours, uh, but we are coordinating uh, the work of those uh, two sets of studies uh, to assure some uh, maximum coordination and consistency. Uh, we are also talking about, uh, with the state, about a more formal uh, legal agreement of cooperation. Uh, the issues involved are novel and complex. Uh, I, uh, representatives of, of my uh, staff and, and of my colleagues here have spent uh, four or five days in the last month meeting with representatives of the state. We will continue uh, to discuss a more formal agreement, but I think the important thing for, uh, for now is that the essential work on damage uh, is being done in a cooperative fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph? Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the U.S. Department of Agriculture's role as a federal natural resource trustee over certain of the natural resources damaged as a result of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Under Executive Order 12580, CERCLA, and the Clean Water Act, the Secretaries of Agriculture, the Interior, and NOAA are the federal officials who act on behalf of the public as trustees to assess and restore the natural resources in Prince William Sound. As General Counsel, I've been working directly with Secretary of Agriculture Clayton Yider and the Department's Forest Service officials in Alaska, the other federal trustee agencies, the Department of Justice, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the State of Alaska to coordinate the trustees' damage assessment, restoration, and legal activities. I am accompanied by Michael A. Barton, the regional forester based in Juneau, Alaska, who has been designated as the Secretary's representative on the Trustee Council. The Alaska-based Trustee Council is composed of both federal and state representatives. It is the operational group through which the Trustee's damage assessment and restoration efforts are carried out. As members of this subcommittee are well aware, the Exxon Valdez tanker, owned by the Exxon Shipping Company, spilled oil along approximately 700 miles of the Alaska coast when it ran aground on Bly Reef last spring. The spill affected 300 miles of the shoreline of the Chugash National Forest. Secretary Yider and the other federal trustees recognize that their role is a critical element of the combined federal and state response to the Exxon Valdez oil spill. As stewards of the nation's natural resources, protecting the environmental integrity of public lands is one of our most crucial missions. To carry out this mission in Prince William Sound, the federal trustees have become directly and actively involved in assessing the damages resulting from the oil spill and moving to restore the resources as quickly and as close as possible to their pre-spill condition. Last year, the trustees authorized the commencement of 59 damage assessment studies, three technical services studies, and one restoration planning study in order to determine the scope and extent of resources damaged by Exxon and any other potentially responsible parties. In August 1989, the Trustee Council published the State Federal Natural Resources Damage Assessment Plan for the Exxon oil spill public review draft. This document provided the public an opportunity to review and comment on the scientific damage assessment process. In the first spill year, from March 24, 1989 through February 28, 1990, the studies authorized by the trustees involved a total cost to the federal and state governments of $35.4 million. Exxon provided $15 million of this amount. USDA's share of the first year's cost was $5.8 million. These studies are essential for the purpose of establishing through scientific and economic analysis the nature and extent of future restoration needs and the amount of damages that can be sought and recovered in litigation. The $15 million Exxon provided in 1989 for the damage assessment studies was shared among the trustees to fund a portion of the, of the ongoing studies. The trustees have requested that Exxon fund the remaining $20 million in costs for, fill, for spill year 1989. But so far, Exxon has declined to respond to that request. For the 1990 spill year, the trustees will be continuing most of the long-term studies and commencing several new ones. We intend to continue to review the information presented to us by government and public sources and to continue those studies that are necessary, one, to identify the restoration work that needs to be done, and two, to provide a basis for recovery through legal action. 
The consequences of the spill of nearly 11 million gallons of crude oil in the pristine waters of Prince William Sound and the despoilment of hundreds of miles of coastal habitat are absolutely horrendous. The administration is committed to recovering the full measure of damages from the potentially responsible parties, and we will use these recoveries to restore, replace, rehabilitate, or acquire the equivalent of the injured or destroyed resources. The millions of dollars already expended by the federal trustees and the state on the assessment studies demonstrate our commitment to building the strongest possible damage recovery case. These studies will also be the foundation for our restoration efforts. I would like to conclude by re-emphasizing that our overriding objective regarding Prince William Sound is to clean it up and restore it to the way it was. President Bush made this unequivocally clear when he said on April 7, our ultimate goal must be the complete restoration of the ecology and the economy of Prince William Sound, including all of its fish, marine mammals, birds, and other wildlife. There's no question that we are embarked on a major precedent-setting endeavor to quantify harm done by this environmental disaster. I believe that the federal and state governments are moving forward vigorously as partners in reaching this objective. Speaking on behalf of the Department of Agriculture, I can assure you, Mr. Chairman, that we are aggressively pursuing all scientific, economic, and legal means within our ability to measure and fix as best we can the severe ecological disruption caused by last year's tragic oil spill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity you have provided for the administration to present its views on this matter. When the presentations of the panel are concluded, Mr. Barton and I would be pleased to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Super. Hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the opportunity to testify today on the Exxon Valdez oil spill. With me is Walt Stieglitz, the Regional Director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the Secretary's representative to the Natural Resource Trustee Council in Alaska. This council was created by the trustees, uh, all, both federal and state, in response to the Exxon Valdez spill to develop the resource assessment plan and advise the trustees. Mr. Chairman, the Department of the Interior, as manager of land and wildlife resources, is deeply involved in all aspects of the response, assessment, and restoration efforts in the wake of the Valdez disaster. With the committee's permission, Interior is now in the process of completing a one-year review report of its activities with respect to cleanup, response, and assessment. And if appropriate, with the permission of the committee, we would like to include it in the record of these proceedings. As resource trustees, we are committed to doing a full assessment. Part of this is necessarily a legal obligation. We will quantify the injury related to the Valdez and present a claim for damages. But I'd like to reiterate a point that Mr. Rawl made, that restoration is also a key element of our plan. Uh, in both the 1989 draft assessment plan and in our work for 1990, restoration was viewed as a basis for ongoing scientific studies related to the assessment. Uh, I would note also that the Environmental Protection Agency in the state uh, in, engaged in the more serious work of restoration by conducting a public symposium on restoration efforts this past March 26th in Alaska. The center of our activities has been the assessment studies for 1989 and our work on a 1990 study. The trustees used the winter months to comprehensively review the studies and the data they provided to determine the course of this year's activity. Last year, the trustees spent over $35 million for assessment. In March, the trustees tentatively approved a new plan for the 1990 study season of roughly the same magnitude. It is our hope that in the next few weeks, we will be able to publish the 1990 studies in time for the spring season. In planning for the assessment, the state and federal governments have continued to work together. The relationship has been at times controversial and required commitment on both sides. But we are currently working with the state to see how to strengthen and improve our cooperative efforts. We, this includes a scientific agreement, economic agreements, and an overall understanding of how the state and federal trustees are to proceed with the assessment. One area of our joint agreement is the letter that has been referenced earlier to Exxon asking for the creation of a joint repository of scientific information on the spill. As a policy matter, Interior would like to make as much information available as possible. 
there is no point in engaging in useless litigation over the ability over the ability of one side or the other to have raw data which we know will ultimately become available to the public and we would like to make as much available data ready to the public as soon as possible so that the scientific and other communities that have interest in the data can can get to it um, to this end we join with the state in in asking for an affirmative answer to our invitation to exxon Mr. Chairman, the trustees owe responsibility to Congress and the American people to conduct a thorough assessment of damages that will lead to the restoration of Prince William Sound in the western Gulf of Alaska. We must do so in an open manner that will assure public understanding of our efforts and successful litigation of our case against those responsible for the accident. To this end, Interior pledges its continued efforts. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of brevity and uh, in an effort not to be redundant, I'll simply submit my remarks for the record. I'd like to make a couple of uh, comments, however. Um, the, uh, Speak into the microphone. I think it'd be good. The National Oceanic and Atmos As Atmospheric Administration is essentially a science organization. At its head right now, we have Dr. John Canals, who was, in fact, uh, one of the founding uh, members who sat on the Stratton Commission uh, to, at the creation of, uh, of NOAA some 20 years ago. And uh, NOAA was created in the aftermath of Earth Day and was given a scientific mission, and that mission was to understand the, 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 uh, the Earth's, Earth's systems, to better understand how the atmosphere and the oceans interrelate, and to be better understand how those systems fit, fit together. So essentially, our mission is an ecological mission. Um, Mr. Chairman, that is reflected in the way that the uh, damage assessment program on NOAA's side is, in fact, uh, organized. Um, to my left is Dr. Bud Ehler, who is the Director of Oceanography and Marine Assessments. And he, uh, along with Steve Penoyer, who is the Regional Director um, uh, for the National Marine Fisheries, uh, and myself, uh, form the management team that, uh, that coordinates NOAA's scientific effort in, in attempting to assess the damage that has been done to the Prince William Sound as a result of this uh, catastrophic oil spill. There is a scientific imperative that drives us here, and that is that this uh, uh, joint repository be established. Uh, this uh, is critical information important to the scientific community and also important to every citizen. It is important that this information be as broadly and widely distributed so that our understanding of this spill and other sp spills can be fully appreciated. Another point I'd like to to, to make sure it is understood, the CERCLA and Clean Water Act processes creates in each of us a stewardship responsibility over the nation's natural marine resources. Uh, NOAA is the steward for the nation's ocean resources. And each of us are dedicated to seeing that those resources are restored to their pre-spill condition. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, part of that is, is following the CERCLA process which requires that the studies that we go forward with are, in fact, reasonable and calculated to lead to discovery of injury. And that is, in fact, what we have attempted to do. Those studies that uh, uh, were initially began uh, went forward upon the basis that we reasonably thought that there would be injury that would be found. Uh, this year, we've discovered that some of those studies did not uh, bear fruit, and we have chosen to discontinue those studies based upon a, a simple reasonableness standard. Was it reasonable to go forward? Um, right now, uh, Exxon has done some reasonable things, and the question is whether or not they will continue to act reasonably. Uh, the reasonable thing for Exxon to do here is to provide the funding and the information necessary to go forward with this scientific repository. In addition to that, the reasonable thing to, for them to do would be to fund the damage assessment. The people responsible for this injury should pay for these expenses, not the taxpayer. NOAA was uh, on the scene of this spill uh, within hours of, of its occurrence. Our scientists were there in assessing the injury. In fact, our scientists were there three years early in conducting a comprehensive assessment so that there was baseline information available to, to understand the condition of the, of the sound prior to the spill. And NOAA is dedicated to be there until, until the very last bit of restoration has been completed. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time and indulgence, and I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Let me start with you. Uh, you suggest that, that, it, that it's reasonable for, uh, for Exxon to pay for these, uh, 
these studies, what's your expectation that that, in fact, is going to be done? It's hard for me, uh, Mr. Chairman, to, to, to judge uh, what is in the mind of, of, of Exxon. We have made requests for them, in fact, to pay this money. And I would hope that uh, uh, in a spirit uh, of, uh, of, uh, of being a good citizen, a good member of the community, that they would want to step up and bear the responsibility for these assessments and, and not have that burden borne by the taxpayer. Do you have anything other than your hope at this uh, moment? Not at this moment. Stuart, there's been no response to your, uh, are you part of the letter uh, that made the request? No, not an actual part of it, but we have, uh, you know, reviewed it and I certainly strongly support it. Uh, Mr. Ra, how about you? You mentioned the same, uh, the same uh, point in your, in your testimony that you think that uh, uh, these studies should be paid for. What's your expectations? Well, there's no indication uh, uh, at this moment, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Exxon uh, will agree uh, to uh, comply with the request that uh, the trustees have submitted, but uh, I do hope that they will recognize uh, that it's in their interest to do so and that, uh, as uh, Mr. Campbell said, as a good uh, uh, public citizen, uh, I hope that they are uh, interested in moving in that direction and perhaps they will see that uh, it's, uh, it's in their interest to do so and they'll respond favorably to our request. Uh, were, you all, were you all at the March, uh, March 2nd meeting of the uh, Washington Policy Group? Were any of you there? Who was there? If you just so I can cease for purpose of questioning. Uh, my understanding uh, uh, that, it, in fact, at that, uh, at that meeting that uh, uh, the Justice Department representatives indicate that you should not expect uh, further money from, uh, from Exxon. Is that correct? That was my, simply my prediction, uh, given that uh, uh, we'd had no answer forthcoming. Uh, uh, from them. Uh, we, uh, the Justice Department, on behalf of the trustees, has uh, actually leased the space in a building in Anchorage for this re repository. Uh, we, uh, there are litigation concerns, obviously, but we, we have, uh, fully support the idea of making uh, publicly available all the basic scientific uh, studies. And uh, uh, so I, I have no expectation uh, or no basis for supposing that Exxon is going to provide this money. I certainly uh, hope they would. So in spite of all your statements, we really don't have any expectations at this point. That, uh, and given their testimony this morning, uh, we really don't have any expectations that they're, gonna, they're going to, uh, to come up with the other $20 million. No, and, and those monies have been, you know, those expenses have been incurred a long time ago. The request has been outstanding. Uh, the door hasn't been shut. What's the impact of this on your various departments? What's the impact of this on NOAA in terms of the next, uh, the continuing these studies and then the next fiscal year? Um, it, Dr. Knauss, uh, our administrator, has made it perfectly clear that we will, we will spend whatever, whatever money is necessary to assess the damages done to the, to the Prince William Sound. How's that going to be done? Um, at term? this point, we are uh, looking at various methods of uh, reprogramming. What are you considering? Um, there are a, a series of, uh, of, of uh, possibilities that are being considered uh, by the budget office and that I'm not prepared to specifically address, but uh, those uh, reprogrammings will be forthcoming and they will be, uh, of course, come up to the Hill for, uh, for their review. Mr. Suberg, Mr. Stiglitz, how does this uh, factor into the, de the Department of uh, Interior's uh, budget? We're estimating uh, roughly about the same level of commitment as last year, somewhere between seven and eight million dollars. That's in your budget? Uh, no, sir. It's not formally in our budget for 1990. We uh, we are similarly exploring the op the availability of uh, of other funds. We do have. Is that in your budget, Mr. Campbell? Uh, no, Your Honor. I, no, Mr. Chairman, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rowell, is that in your budget? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is not in our budget, but uh, the, we do plan uh, on an uh, amount of uh, just over $10 million for fiscal year 1990 
and are providing for it on the basis of a reprogramming. Uh, the, uh, that plan and the uh, appropriate uh, uh, letters of uh, letters to the uh, Congressional Appropriations Committees have been submitted. Uh, so we have already uh, 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 prepared and planned for uh, providing the full amount for the 1990 uh, damage assessment studies. Uh, USDA, uh, as the other trustee agencies as well, uh, is fully committed to going forward uh, with the, uh, the necessary damage assessment studies. Uh, uh, we believe that, uh, that Exxon should provide those funds but uh, in the event that they uh, continue not to provide the uh, $20 million previously, previously requested in any further amounts, uh, we are prepared uh, to go forward and are, in fact, going forward. Mr. Stewart, is Exxon correct that, uh, that the memorandum of uh, agreement uh, with respect to the, uh, to the studies was, has been violated by, uh, by the parties to it? I'm not aware. I'm sorry I wasn't uh, here for, the, uh, for all the testimony this morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I, I don't know what the reference is. Frankly. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I don't, I don't recall the April 1989 memorandum of agreement giving any sort of consultative rights to Exxon. It was simply an agreement that they'd provide $15 million. So, uh, well, under your argument, they have properly discharged their, uh, their obligations? They, they have provided the $15 million, but under the terms of the agreement, we have the ability to ask for more. And, and under that clause, we did ask for another $20 million, yes. But you disagree with the uh, statements by Exxon that, that uh, uh, which, which essentially, if I can paraphrase them, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially they said that the, the agreement uh, had not been lived up to by the parties, <laughs> therefore they felt no further obligation to provide additional monies. You disagree with that? I do disagree with that. Ms. Campbell? I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Uh, Mr. Rawl? As do I, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, in the uh, uh, process for review of the studies, uh, Exxon was afforded the opportunity to come and make an oral statement to a, a government panel that was uh, reviewing the studies, and they uh, declined to uh, uh, exercise that option. They suggest that you had their full, uh, their full written statement uh, prior uh, uh, to that. What what additional opportunity would they have availed themselves of had they come in, in well, they the second have, to the, your, your, uh, this is the second hearing, right, where you could make oral presentations? That's right. They could have had a chance to actually uh, have a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, exchange uh, with the people that were uh, responsible for some of the decisions about uh, the value of the studies and whether to go forward. And at least uh, in my experience in administrative practice before uh, uh, various uh, government agencies, most people look upon that as a, a valuable additional right, rather than just sitting uh, filing a large chunk of paper, you're not sure how it's going to be read or not. That was done uh, when? I don't have the exact date, but last fall. I believe it was December, Mr. Chairman. It was December, and their, their original written statement was in? Uh, October, I believe. I'm not quite sure. It was the earlier autumn. And who did avail themselves of that second opportunity? Um, a number of the environmental groups did. Um, I, I can't recall which one specifically. I believe Audubon Society may have. But, but people did, people participated in it as if it was a, uh, this was a legitimate forum yes, to Mr. air Chairman. these differences? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think that's, that's helpful because, I mean, uh, for those of you who are in the room, the clear representation is, one, that the agreement has been breached, and two, that, uh, uh, that they don't like the way this, uh, 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 this trusteeship is now operating and they've made their statements, I think you raise a, a very valid point as to if, if they felt that strongly about it and they potentially uh, can be either the beneficiaries or the victims of it and yet they didn't avail themselves of, of, uh, of all of those forums, it, it raises the issue whether they're really here with clean hands with respect to uh, uh, the denial of payment and also the, uh, the protocol uh, uh, under which these, these studies are, are going forward. Let me ask you, was it, at the, was it at, the, at, the, uh, at the March meeting where the decision was made about which studies would, be, would go forward and which ones uh, would not go forward? Or tell uh, yeah. me when that was done and then I can tell you whether it was March or not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I believe it was uh, in, that, uh, in that time frame where uh, tentative decisions were reached. Who can take me through that process? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll do my best. I, uh, the, the way the process works, and 
is that uh, obviously a great deal of the day-to-day -day assessment activity is done by the trustee council in Alaska, Mr. Barton, Mr. Stieglitz, and Mr. Penoyer, along with Mr. Collinsworth from the state. Uh, the way the process has worked is that they, uh, relying on the people at their disposal, the management team uh, that looks at the more technical aspects of the study, the legal team that looks at some of the legal issues. Would these essentially be people within government, various yes, sir. levels of government? Yes. Either actual government employees or, as we've gotten more sophisticated, you know, occasionally expert witnesses retained by justice. Um, the trustees, uh, the trustee council comes up with tentative proposals that it then submits to the trustees uh, for final, for final approval. And uh, that was the process. The March 2 uh, meeting was the kickoff of the process whereby we started to uh, receive information from the trustee council on their tentative 1990 plans. Um, a more detailed plan, a more detailed written plan is, is coming in, but they were given tentative approval, I believe, in, on April 3rd uh, to proceed with the 1990 uh, assessment activities, and, and that generally is the process. Now, the decision for weeding out the, the studies that you didn't want to, uh, to go forward with, that decision was made by the policy group here in Washington. A recommendation was submitted to you. Did you, did you follow that recommendation? Did you change it? Or? Um, I think we ended up following all of the trustee council proposals. We did raise questions, obviously, in the course of the review. You, um, there were some disagreements uh, amongst the council members, I believe, and, and some of their, their employees about which studies, which direction studies should go, what level of funding they should receive, um, whether or not a study has given all the data it's going to give, basically. But in the end, the trustees ended up adopting the trustee council proposals. Is there a reason why that's not uh, subject to, to public comment or input? Uh, is there a formal reason? Is there a legal reason? Is there? Uh, is there? Well, um, we have uh, we have attempted to uh, accommodate some public comment, and, and obviously some of the earlier panelists didn't weren't particularly pleased with the process. But uh, last year. Uh, which was an unusual year because we had a lot of the studies in essence underway given the exigencies of the, of the timing. You know, it was a short season, the spill had occurred. The, uh, the public comment period uh, took place relatively late in the process. Um, our, our regulations and, and the practice has been that, yes, we would seek public comment, and, and we did, I believe I'm speaking adequately for the council, I do believe the council did consider the public comment they got from last year's exercise and coming up with this year's plan. And I believe it's the desire of the trustees to have a public comment again this year for what we do next year. Wait a minute. <laughs> Are we missing the year here? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand well, the question. Well, as, as, as I see the controversy that's being, that's being raised is, is how, do you, how, do you, how do you take what you've learned in this last year and the decisions that were made or not made about whether these should be five-year studies, three-year studies, or ten-year studies, what have you, and how you make the decision to go forward. And, and one of the crucial decisions appears to be that has been made is that you will go on a year-by-year -year basis sort of looking back without, without setting in motion any long-term studies and letting them, letting them go. It, it would be suggested, been suggested by me and, I, and, and by others that, that that's a filtering process that 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 uh, that may improperly eliminate uh, studies before you really know the the real outcome or I, the I, potential of that study. I I guess I would point out that you know the desire is not to filter down. I think the the process of looking back and seeing what your last year of study did is is tremendously important from a, both a methodological and data standpoint. Um, I would also note that in, in the in the council recommendations, I believe are the commencement of new studies that look at. Uh, various issues. So I, I don't fully anticipate it will be a winnowing down process. In, in, in between last year and this year, I think there were the commencement of a few new studies that we didn't have on the books last year. Mr. Stewart, does it prejudice our legal position to, to have uh, uh, informal public involvement by, by other scientific groups and organizations and, and so forth to, to look at this and to, and to comment? Uh, well, I uh, is that improper? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking. Well, there is a there is a litigation concern, and uh, we have uh, uh, retained uh, on behalf of the uh, our clients, the trustee agencies, expert witnesses to review those 
studies in part from a view of, of litigation. And that part of the process, I think, could not go on the public record because uh, that would be litigation uh, sensitive. But apart from that, repeat, I, I, repeat, I wouldn't repeat, see. Back uh, up for uh, a second. You lost me around the corner I'm sorry. here. You, 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 you have a process. What's the process that shouldn't be part public? What the assessments of our expert witnesses, potential witnesses in litigation about the studies, uh, that is something that is okay. relevant from a litigation strategy. Um, but in terms of the, of the basic study proposals, I don't see any uh, okay. prejudice let me, from let the me, viewpoint Let me ask you on, on that point. It was raised earlier uh, by myself. And that is, if, you're, if your expert witnesses from a litigation point of view, and this is obviously going to have to be a primary concern of yours, uh, says that the study doesn't make any sense, there's not a way to handle this within the litigation for whatever reasons, uh, does that knock a study out? Uh, it wouldn't necessarily uh, from the, uh, for, it, w it might from the viewpoint of would we get recovery? Uh, legal recovery of no, I understand costs. that. I understand that. And that may be yeah. a very valid point. Yes. Sir. And probably from your point of view, for the moment at Justice, yes. that is valid. And I but with respect to these other agencies here and the concern of the public and, and legitimate scientific inquiry about what is the impact of an oil spill yeah. of this size, magnitude, and, and location, are we knocking studies out because we've decided that really, from a litigation point of view, there's no cost benefit? Uh, not, uh, not to my knowledge. Campbell? Um, I'd like to say a couple things, and I'd like Dr. Ehler to address some of the scientific aspects and, and how this, the selection process has occurred. Um, but in fact, what we're doing is, is determining whether or not the studies are likely to lead to, uh, to discovery of, of an injury. And if, if it is reasonably calculated to lead to discovery of an injury, then we can recover the taxpayers' money. No, 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 no. Well, but let me just interrupt you. Are you looking for for an injury that's provable in court, or are you looking for an injury that would be important to us? So we, if we have a future oil spill, we might be able to react differently, or in some other fashion that would be helpful. What we're looking towards our our mandate under CERCLA and the Clean Water Act is the restoration of the Prince William Sound, and my obligation as a, as as a, having a portion of that stewardship is to find out the full panoply of injuries that have occurred. But is that restoration, let me ask you, and I, I'm not, I'm just, sure. is that restoration, and I'm asking what the accident, is that restoration with respect to what you can then prove in court to get the defendant to restore, or is that restoration in, in, in what I might consider sort of a pure environmental sense that we need to know so whether or not the defendant does it or doesn't do it, there may be actions that still have to be taken in the public interest to put, to put Prince William Sound and the environments back together again? Our aim is the restoration of the Prince William Sound, and we're willing, we're willing to do whatever studies are necessary to determine what can be done for restoration of the Prince William Sound. Without regard to whether or not costs can be recovered in, in a subsequent possible lawsuit. If in, fact, if, in fact, we can do restoration as a result of these studies, then those costs can, in fact, be recovered. I don't think that they're inconsistent. I, well, the cost can be recovered if you're successful in court. No. We, heard we don't exactly have a, a, actually, a willing uh, payee Mr. here. At the moment. Actually, Mr. Chairman, um, in fact, if, if we are reasonable in going out and doing our studies, even if the studies don't find an injury, if we were reasonable in conducting the study in the first place, the court will, in fact, still award our costs. Mr. I, Chairman, I might just supplement that to say I think that the, that the distinction the Chairman is drawing is, is there theoretically. I just haven't seen it practically. In so it's your, te it's your testimony that, that, that you are not, the, the, the policy group, the trustees at this point, are not excluding uh, any scientific studies uh, because of a litigation threshold. I'd, I'd put it the other way around, and, and, and the trustees can, can I, I, uh, representatives can speak for themselves, that, that we are, intend to argue for a rather broad uh, construction of what recoverable costs are. And any studies that are reasonably necessary to decide upon appropriate restoration as well as to undertake restoration projects, in our view, will be uh, recoverable. And that could include some uh, basic scientific studies that would be part of the total decision-making process on what is the necessary so, response so here. So now that I've put it one way and you've put it another way, let me see if I put it another way. <laughs> 
unfortunately, none of us are on the meter here, but. Um, <laughs> When you look at a study for the purposes of the trusteeship and the question is the, the standard of reasonableness you're telling me is whether or not this will reasonably lead you to find out whether or not harm has in fact been done by the incident. Or and or the appropriate means of uh, restoring the environment. And the appropriate means of restoring the environment and that that is done with respect to the environment. Yes. And if you follow that standard, theoretically, you will get your cost back yes. at a minimum, and you may later be able to use that in court to get yes. restoration yes. Uh, paid not for. It is not, question, it's not a question. It is, I'm asking you, it has not been a question for the trusteeship of whether or not you will get your <clears throat> cost back. I think the standards are functionally the same. What a reasonable... Uh, approach to scientific studies are and what a judge would find reasonable, at least on the present law, we think are the same. This is not an area where there's been much law. We might <laughs> get some developing law where the courts were construing it very narrowly and then we might have some divergence. But I don't, I don't think that the, 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 the standard of, of prudent management of scientific research here and the standard of litigation considerations are really any, any different. Mr. Chairman, may I, uh, if I could just uh, add something, there's a... Well, I guess let me ask, ask you this with respect to, to, to long-term studies, though. Mm. You're, 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 you had one time frame that ended last March with respect to a, to a settlement. And you have a potential civil litigation that could, could start in, in four years or five years. And the question is... Where, where do you wrap this up when, when if, you, if, if somebody made a case for, for a 10-year study or a 20-year study? I don't know that anybody has, but, but I, where does that collide with? with uh, I don't think that's necessarily uh, out of the question. We don't know at this point, obviously, uh, how long it's going to take to really determine uh, the impacts. And, and uh, I think our job is to do, to do the necessary studies now without uh, saying that. I don't think we can say that there is a... Uh, close-off point beyond which studies won't be necessary. Mr. Chairman, can I make a few comments from the uh, uh, perspective of a <clears throat> manager of a science program? Uh, much has been made about uh, reducing the number of studies. Uh, in NOAA's case, um, uh, we have eliminated three studies uh, from the first year to the second year. Uh, none of those decisions were made by uh, uh, people back here in Washington in terms of bureaucrats or policymakers uh, deciding one way or the other on the merits of the science. They were made by the scientific uh, personnel that were involved in the studies. One of them was the decision not to continue autopsying uh, whale carcasses because you simply can't do that uh, over time. Uh, two other studies were discontinued, both of them rather small because of the lack of baseline data with which to compare the effects of the oil uh, uh, pre and post uh, spill. So they were scientific uh, decisions that had nothing to do with uh, uh, budgets uh, back here. In fact, we have added uh, a rather large study on oil toxicity for the second year that is uh, uh, starting a, as we speak, uh, it's approximately an $870,000 study. Is that true for the, for the rest of the departments? I mean, obviously one of the allegations that we're here to sort it out, but one of the allegations is that budget considerations are, are, are driving some of these uh, Can I make one other, one other point? Yes, Again, I, I think uh, there's been a um, uh, much made of the lack of long-term planning. Uh, I think the scientific community knows what needs to be done, and they're in the process of doing that. Uh, I don't think it's a question of, um, of funding. I think the funding decisions are, in fact, being made on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, uh, partially based on uh, legal implications and budget implications. That's a reality that we have in any, at least in the budget side, uh, any science program. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we do have um, uh, a fairly good idea of what we have to do over time, and uh, only the budget decisions are restricted to a year-to-year -year kind of decision-making process. <coughs> Uh, let me just ask if we got an ambiguity here. Uh, you say that you, pre you, you prepared the 89 damage assessment plan under which we initiated 18 studies, and this year you're saying you're going ahead with 12 studies in your testimony. That's six. You uh, mentioned three. Yeah, the uh, original testimony uh, should have said 15 studies. We okay. went back under, uh, that was just a typo. Uh, there were 15 studies that were uh, Typos, conducted. Typos, careers are made of. Uh, <laughs> uh, only in law. <laughs> uh, let me ask you, Ms. Stewart, about, your, uh, about where we are with the state of Alaska and the Department of Justice. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Well, as I said in my uh, uh, oral statement here, uh, we uh, are in uh, the process of discussing possible uh, uh, legal agreements uh, between the federal government, particularly the federal trustee agencies, uh, and Alaska. Uh, there are a lot of uh, novel and difficult issues uh, involved in that. Uh, obviously, there are common interests between the federal government and Alaska, but also differences of uh, perspective and perhaps some different interests. Uh, we've been meeting on a regular basis to see if those can be concluded, but that has not impeded the practical cooperation on the uh, assessment studies, both uh, scientific and economic, that are really the, the heart of the matter. So. The practical work is getting done. If we can wrap it up with a nice uh, legal package, uh, we're still so trying to see whether we can do that. Let me ask you, uh, again, I'm referring to the March, uh, the March meeting and uh, March 2nd meeting, excuse me, that uh, uh, the trustees then congratulated the Justice Department on the memorandum of agreement and later Justice remarked at the time of the MOA was developed, the federal trustees were concerned that they maintain a cooperative relationship with Alaska but now that concern had been overridden by Alaska's refusal to accept the settlement. Is that just a burst of anger, or is that an operative fact, or what's going on here? I would say frustration, perhaps. Uh, the, uh, uh, the formal agreement uh, that we had been negotiating uh, had been uh, uh, keyed to a possible uh, uh, negotiated disposition with Exxon. Uh, and when uh, that did not eventuate, uh, we uh, are sort of back to the drawing board. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we had our differences on that matter, uh, but uh, I think uh, we are in a good cooperative working relationship now, uh, and we are just uh, trying to look again uh, at uh, the possibility of a legal, uh, legal arrangement. I think we're having uh, good, constructive uh, discussions. Are, you, are, the are the trustees meeting without Alaska? Still, I mean, are you continuing to meet at times without Alaska? Is there still differences that you think within your positions that have to be preserved by meeting separately on some of these issues? Or From time to time, yes, we, we caucus um, just to sort out ourselves to get a, a common that's, position. That's with respect to litigation? Uh, sometimes, uh, yes. We have, Is that uh, with respect to the studies or the scientific uh, charge of the trustees? Uh, I haven't attended uh, any of those meetings. Uh, I don't assume know there's some help. informal, uh, you know, federal uh, coordination that may or may not uh, always involve the state. What is what, what is your what is your understanding, or what is your arrangement with respect to the state in terms of future uh, negotiations of a settlement? Will they be included at the at the front end, or or will they be told after the fact? Will they be given time to comment? What's their status? Well, uh, I don't, uh, we haven't really addressed that issue. I don't see any negotiations, uh, I don't, there aren't any pending. Uh, I don't know of any that are likely to arise. We are simply pressing forward. You're planning uh, to go to trial? We're planning to go to trial. Um, <laughs> and uh, we are moving aggressively. Uh, at the state, uh, there was a sort of division of labor on the criminal side. The state had its case, uh, uh, and we have ours, and uh, we're just uh, pressing forward. Had the uh, settlement been entered into, uh, what what would have that what would that have done to the uh, to the work of the of the trustees? Would that have settled that out? Uh, would, would my the, my would the studies uh, that go forward have been determined by the by the settlement or by no. current law? No, by under the current arrangements would go forward. The only so the questions of restoration would have carried over into the uh, in, into the, the other lawsuit. Yes, well, the part of the settlement, and I I, can, I don't want to go into the terms, but limiting what's sort of been publicly reported was to provide funding for studies and restoration projects, and then if uh, additional monies were needed, if the projects, if the studies show that additional funds were needed, uh, the uh, civil litigation uh, would have been available to achieve that. But, but with respect to the, the money, and I'm trying to deal with what's yeah. been publicly said, but yes. with respect to what has been alleged to be $400 million for this purpose, the expenditure of that money was still tied to the consent of Exxon and or the approval of the court? Uh, there would have been some monies that would have just been put up without uh, any review and, and some monies uh, under a limited review by the court, but no vetoes uh, by Exxon. What would have happened to the future of, of the studies that the trustees have currently undertaken? I'm confident they would be fully funded. 
Was that a term? Was that part of the agreement? No, but uh, there was an initial large chunk of money that was totally unrestricted. And I, and my view is that the even if uh, we were further down the road, the, the studies here are certainly of a quality that uh, uh, would have uh, would have been fully funded. So were we settling an obligation that Exxon already had under the law? Or? Well, I, my view it is restitution as part of a uh, of a, a criminal disposition that there had been injury uh, to the environment and that first has been stated here you need studies to determine what the extent of the injury and what the restoration is we have a victim here but we don't know how badly injured the victim is so that's number one how badly is the injured is the victim and then to take uh, some substantial steps towards uh, making the victim whole that was the theory but we <laughs> I don't, I shouldn't say this, but I assume it's rather rare that we let the defendant prescribe the, the treatment for the victim. Well, I think we're dealing with an unusual situation where and, and normally the, the state of the victim is known at the time of a disposition. And uh, when there's some dispute about uh, the health of the victim, uh, then perhaps the, uh, the person that uh, has the obligation to, to pay ought to have some limited voice, and that's all that I would certainly tolerate, some limited voice. Uh, in uh, saying, well, is the victim really that? How, how was it injured? arrived at that, that we could we could engage in a in a settlement prior to the completion of the trustee's work? I don't think it was at all inconsistent. There was no total. As I've said, any disposition in the criminal case would be would leave civil remedies fully open, so that uh, uh, if more funds were needed, uh, those would those would be available. There was no it would be no disruption of the orderly process of uh, restoration. What, ha what, ha what was allowed in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this four-year period before uh, decisions were made? Studies would go forward. Discovery would go forward. Uh, our preparation for civil litigation would have been unimpeded. And if we had, if we had continued funding problems, that would have had to been resolved here. Exxon would have had... If would've... necessary, yes. But there would but, be no disruption of, 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 of the orderly process. But again, in, in the settlement of, of the criminal action, from what you said, in terms of we don't know how badly uh, uh, the victim has been injured, how do you arrive at that? That's what the damage assessment studies are for. Mr. Chairman, one point that I think is real crucial here is that there was no cap uh, on, our, on the ability of the uh, trustees to be able to recover. There was just simply a fund of money that would be made available. And if at the end of this period of time uh, there was uh, additional monies that were required to facilitate the restoration, then the litigation option would continue to be open or we could pursue additional uh, uh, settlement efforts. Um, the, it, it really did not prejudice the uh, federal government or the state's uh, ability to address the restoration of the sound. Well, I guess I, w I would raise some issue with that because, again, I, it goes to the question of the extent of, of the injuries, the, the outrage of the public as to uh, the nature of the crime may change if, in fact, they were to find out, and we don't know that they will, that, that, that the injuries were far more severe. If the victim dies after the settlement, people can be, uh, can be outraged. But, but, you're on, uh, but, but uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, what, what we're saying here is that, say, say that the agreement provided for, for example, as reported, $500 million. No, I understand that. But at, the, at, at that point, the question of whether or not you have pleaded as a criminal or not as a criminal and whether you, you, have, you, have, you have prevented yourself from being charged as a criminal by buying out at that amount is determined as to the state of the knowledge and, and what you believe you can do or not do one year after the crime as opposed to three or four years after the crime when you have a greater, a greater knowledge. There's some PR value in not being labeled a corporate criminal. Mr. Well, Mr. Well, Chairman, I if, I just, could, uh, if I could just add something uh, to that, I think that uh, one needs to uh, uh, contrast uh, the discussion of the, uh, the settlement as publicly reported, not with what, uh, um, uh, what figures might uh, or might not have been uh, uh, shocking, but rather compared to a possible criminal trial. And as Mr. Stewart has indicated, the Department of Justice is going to pr is uh, is proceeding uh, along the road to prosecuting the action through a criminal trial. And what one needs to compare in evaluating uh, the uh, the prior settlement that uh, was publicly reported uh, is against the likely results of a criminal trial. And I think that's the standard that has to be uh, borne in mind as to whether the uh, the results uh, uh, or the the, uh, 
terms that have been publicly reported made sense or not, uh, not against some uh, other hypothetical amount over a, over a, over a long term, because that it's, process it's, it's, is the it's civil. Not, it's not the amount. It's not the amount. Yep. This isn't, as I said, this isn't about extracting yep. uh, money improperly from Exxon. That's not what this is about. It's a question of whether or not these decisions and, and in fact, uh, uh, the court can make a determination based upon the best evidence available. And if that evidence is still in the accumulative process, then the question is, where does that go? It would be very interesting to see when you start to match up against the best evidence when Exxon uh, continues to pursue its, its studies versus your studies and the studies you haven't done or have done. I mean, we, you know, we, that's all subject to litigation. I appreciate litigation. the chairman's point here. It is a rather sort of unique situation. And, and, and I would just say that we would never uh, have a, uh, accept a disposition that didn't include guilty pleas to serious offenses so there would, and fines. So there would be a criminal, explicitly criminal element as well as restitution. And secondly, I think it's our judgment that while you might want to, you could wait a number of years before you brought or prosecuted the criminal case, uh, there is a right to speedy trial, and, and I think it's probably better, despite the uncertainties, to, to move forward with the criminal process. I don't, I don't disagree with that. It, it was the settlement of that that, that, uh, uh, that, that concerned me. Let me, uh, I have some additional questions that I'd like to submit to, uh, uh, to you. Uh, with respect to some of, this some of the additional scientific uh, questions being raised here. Uh, let me thank you for your testimony, but uh, also uh, say that uh, uh, certainly as, as, as one who is, is, is elected by the, uh, by the public uh, and, and tries to stay in touch, I hope you appreciate the outrage uh, over this uh, over this incident, and and the word trusteeship here is probably all in capital letters. Uh, you're our representatives. You're the best we have under this uh, under the current law. We've heard a lot of recommendations how the law uh, can be changed. There's very little likelihood that law is going to be changed during your uh, your trusteeship. So you're going to have to work with it as 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 the cards were dealt you. But the uh, uh, you don't need any lectures from me on the public interest. But I just got to tell you that in this case, I think it's 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 a very very important standard uh, that you carry into uh, into this one, both on behalf of the public and I think also on behalf of the scientific community. Uh, we've gone through a rather unfortunate uh, decade where we've uh, manipulated scientific evidence rather heavily, and and uh, for the convenience of uh, of various parties in this country, and we ought not to continue that. We certainly ought not to continue it in the case of this, uh, uh, of this magnitude. So I would just hope you appreciate the charge that you, uh, that you have. Mr. Chairman, you asked initially whether or not uh, I had any evidence that Exxon would in fact pay for this damage assessment and this uh, uh, joint uh, scientific uh, repository. I think the evidence is that I don't think the American taxpayer will allow that not to happen. And I think that uh, ultimately, uh, the American taxpayer should not pay these expenses. Exxon should pay these expenses. I couldn't agree with you more. I just hope, because let me ask just one, I'm sorry, just one question, Mr. Stiglitz. Uh, what's your response to, uh, uh, to Exxon's testimony uh, uh, in, in March that, uh, that sheens resulting from the remaining oiled shorelines are not a threat to fish and wildlife and that the remaining oil has little toxicity? Do you? Agree with that at this point? Disagree with it, or where are you? I'm, I'm afraid I have to disagree with that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's very obvious, of course, that the sheens that we've seen occurring over this past winter don't uh, carry the same threat to fish and wildlife resources as, uh, as a freshly spilled oil, because obviously with the weathering process, some of the toxic toxicity uh, has dissipated. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about the actual impacts of, of those sheens, but obviously if there's, a, if there's oil on the water, there's a threat to fish and wildlife. Uh, it might be a little different than freshly spilled oil, but we still feel like there's a threat there. So you, th you, would, you would suggest at a minimum that this, uh, this dismissal of that threat by Exxon is somewhat premature? I would certainly agree with that. But it, we is, don't. it is premature. It is premature. Uh, what about uh, uh, with respect to, uh, uh, to sublethal injuries in terms of, 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 of we identified those or what's your position on those at the moment? Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, we're in the, we're in the process of identifying those, and as uh, some earlier testimony indicated, I, we're, we're highly concerned about that. The, the body counts are an obvious impact of the spill, but, uh, but I think we're even more concerned about some of the sublethal effects. Uh, our, our studies are designed to look at this factor. Well, we've already seen some evidence, in, for instance, in the production of bald eagles in the spill impact area last year. Uh, uh, eagles uh, nesting in the impact area uh, produced only one-third of the young eaglets that uh, we noted in control areas that which were not impacted by the spill. Um, it, I have personally have a very high level of concern about sublethal impacts, but we were not very far along in identifying those. Our studies will do that, though, in the longer run. Is it fair to say that, uh, uh, again, with, with the suggestion that the fact that, 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 that salmon are in Prince William Sound and eagles are in the sky and the peregrine falcons are in the, uh, in the sky, that is, not, that is not conclusive as to whether or not sublethal uh, effects are in the system? Uh, the, the presence of live fish and wildlife is certainly no indication that uh, no impacts have occurred. Uh, I'm a little disturbed by those, by those kinds of observations because uh, it's, it's obvious that this bill didn't completely eliminate any populations of any species. But to ignore the fact that some substantial reductions in certain of those populations has taken place is certainly misleading in my view. That's our concern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your testimony. Marty. Let me just say that it's the, uh, it's the concern of the, uh, of, of, of the chair that is, as we continue to uh, pursue uh, our charge in the oversight of, uh, of this spill, uh, that all of the uh, all of the parties to this uh, of this controversy would 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 make their best attempt to deal with this uh, uh, on the facts, and and I I I'm just terribly concerned that uh, uh, the, the much of this controversy continues to be engaged in with uh, with a great deal of of spin control uh, rather than uh, than healthy scientific uh, uh, investigation. Uh, with that, the uh, the committee will uh, will stand adjourned. Join us tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Book Notes with author Robert Caro. He'll discuss his book, Means of Ascent, The Years of Lyndon Johnson. That's tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 on the West Coast. Up next, a Senate hearing concerning funding for the arts. Thank you.